We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. My name is Rob H. I am your host this week, and I am here with... Lee Overstreet, pinch hitting once again, filling in for Tom here on AV Rant. Happy to be here. Amazed I made it. <laughs> Amazed you made it. You, you, you were just, warned this time. This was know, a super I know. short notice. I, there was just, you know, stuff going on today. But you know, okay. I just got done at the optometrist, which uh-huh. is directly related to enjoying AV. I can promise you that. It sure is. Yeah. Yeah. You need that vision. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I just walked in the door like shortly before I rang you on this Google Hangout. So That's right. we're, <laughs> we're all rushing into doors and sitting down in front of microphones and cameras to get this podcast to you. But we are here. This is AV <laughs> Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, if you're looking for the regular host of this podcast, Mr. Tom Andre, he is on vacation right now down in yes, Puerto sir. Rico. And he sent us this image over here on Facebook uh, with a nice little message to me. Uh, that, that's our good uh, friend Efren there in Puerto Rico that uh, Tom actually got to meet in real live person. Look how happy Tom looks to meet Efren. I don't think Tom was that happy to meet me. (laughs) (laughs) But then again, I came to his house and he had to cook for me. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, so the thing is, both you and Efren uh, uh, have now actually met Tom in person. I never have. I mean, I- I've been talking to Tom for, I mean, close to the 10 years because I-, I was like one of the earliest people to contact him in the early, early days of AV Rant. He and I have never actually met in, in physical space. So Right. It's how- been over that? five years that I've been filling in at one time or another for Tom and I think once for you as well. Yep. And uh, yeah, it was very nice to meet him. He is exactly as you think he is. <laughs> Well, yeah, we don't edit ourselves on this no, podcast. Uh, we are uh, who we are. That's, it would not be a shock uh, yeah. to meet us. We're not uh, personas <laughs> on TV at all. Right, right. I always believe in absolute realism, and that's that's what people appreciate, especially on YouTube and online in general. So if you meet me, I'm this. If you meet Rob, he's that. If you meet Tom, he is that. One thing that surprised me, though, Tom can cook. Yeah, yeah, he I can mean, cook. let me like tell you. That's a passion of his, for sure. Dude, that, I mean, he whipped up some good... He even had me like a, a, a little sort of hipster fancy beer that he had oh, okay. on hand. Okay. So my, my wife and I were just super happy eating dinner and hanging out with him and watching a movie. It was great. <laughs> well, I'm sure Efren is also enjoying, because uh, there, there's no way that Tom would go all the way down there and not cook a meal for him. So uh, so yes, yeah. we're, we're very uh, hoping that Tom and his family are having a great time down there. Uh, he, he should be back next week. That's the plan. Um, yeah, before we get into other stuff, I will say this is AV Rant. We answer your home theater and AV questions. And to get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You send them via email to question at avrant.com. That is by far the best way to get your questions sent to us. But you can also contact us in other ways. You can reach us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. You can reach us on our website, of course, which is avrant.com, and you can leave a question there. Or you can find us on YouTube, which is youtube.com slash avrant. But please don't send a question for the podcast to uh, to to us on YouTube because it uh, we, we, we don't do that. Right. We, we, Man, we do YouTube, YouTube comment sections are just the, 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 just the lowest part of humanity. <laughs> And it not really all is. of ours have been. I don't want to make it sound like every comment. We've had some very nice comments on YouTube and that, but it's just right. uh, uh, sifting through all the stuff that we have to uh, to have to erase and have not posted on our videos. It's uh, that that is not the way to cut it. So question at avrant.com. Please do it that way. You can also reach me directly. I'm Rob at avrant.com. My Twitter is at First Reflect, and Tom is at uh, Tom at avrant.com, and he is at avrant underscore Tom on Twitter. And uh, folks can reach Lee if they'd like to on Twitter as well, right? Yes, they can. I'm on Twitter as Lee Overtweet. Mm-hmm. Lee Overtweet. And uh, people do uh, add me every now and then. I've had people communicate with me. It's super fun. Uh, anytime I get some random person, I go, I bet you I know what that's from. <laughs> and uh, it's cool, though. I, I love it so much. So if anybody wants to follow me, I mean, you're going to get the real me. You're going to get mm-hmm. you know some politics and personal stuff and uh, <laughs> random nonsense and stream of consciousness, but whatever. And I'm also on Instagram, and I just like to let people figure out the Instagram uh, handle based on my Twitter handle of Lee Overtweet. And knowing can, that knowing that Lee likes puns. 
Yes. So, so uh, a few people important. have guessed and found me on Instagram. <laughs> I'm sure they would. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's see. What, what what else do we have to do at the top of the show here? Because I'm so, I'm not used to being the uh, the regular the, the you're not normally the quarterback no, of this team, are you? It's usually Tom doing all that stuff. But uh, but I guess what we can do is thank our listeners of the week. Yes, we That's can. Something we can do. And uh, one of the ways to be a listener of the week is to support us financially. And you can come over to avrant.com. And over on the right hand side, there is a support the podcast button. That'll take you to PayPal. You do not have to have a PayPal account, although, of course, you can use your PayPal account if you have one. Uh, but you can just enter a credit card if you don't want to sign up for PayPal to give us a one-time donation that way. A couple of people did that this week. Uh, Justin B., that is not the fellow we always refer to as Justin Not Bieber. This is a different Justin B. So This uh, is actual Justin Bieber this time. Th this might be actual <laughs> Justin Bieber this time. That's right. Uh, no, no. I saw his last it's name. Not. It's not Bieber. But uh, Justin B. and Nathan D. are a couple of fellows who sent some dollars our way. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Yes, yes. Thank you guys so very much. And apparently Patreon, we're up to uh, 62 patrons. That is correct. Well, it was at least last night. Who knows? Sometimes that number goes up and down. But yeah, that's uh, patreon.com uh, slash avrantpodcast. Uh, over at Patreon, you can sign up. It's a monthly subscription. Uh, the minimum is a dollar a month, or you can up do up to infinity dollars a month if you'd like to. And that <laughs> automatically comes out of your uh, credit card account that you've signed up with Patreon there and get sent a portion of it to us. Uh, you Patreon can also put it in portion. your will, by the way. Can There's you something really? To think about. Yeah, very good. <laughs> you really could. You could set up a trust. Anyway, never mind. Yes. But you could. And, it is a thing you could do. <laughs> and Justin B, the, the same Justin B, let us know that he is a patron over at patreon.com. So double uh -huh. thanks to Justin there. Yes, and, thank uh, you, Justin. Yeah, and uh, also wanted to mention, uh, we've talked over the past couple of weeks, uh, Chris P is one of our listeners who sent a Insteon hub for us to give away. Right. Uh, now, we said that all the entries had to be in by June 30th, so we're past that now. You can't we enter are. to win that Insteon hub anymore. I don't know who won. Tom didn't let me know, so I'm not announcing it this week. We'll announce it next week when Tom is back. It's and not like this thing was hashed out really clearly. It, it, <laughs> we figured it out on air and in a very clunky way. So I'm amazed that any entries at all managed to find their way to Tom. Uh, but apparently everyone did listen because I didn't get a single entry at the question at avrant.com website uh, or email address. So so everybody listened and sent them directly to Tom hey, as requested. Yeah, don't so be good. surprised that people really pay attention and are a little <laughs> bit smarter than the average bear listening to the show. I mean, you, I, you're... I you thought know, at least one would sneak through, you know, just just from no, like man. a reply all or something. But anyway, our thanks to Chris for furnishing that Insteon hub. And uh, yeah, uh, the entries are closed. Somebody will be getting that Insteon hub next week. Uh, and finally, the same Justin B. Once again, you don't have to support the podcast financially to uh, to be a listener of the week. Um, you can just support us in other ways. But he sent in that donation with the hopes that we would possibly help him out, and we're going to try. I can't, yes, no guarantees are. here, Justin, but we're going to try. Uh, he uh, has a friend of his who is a master woodworker, and together they designed mm -hmm. and built this 10-foot wide, 4-foot deep, 88-inch tall stage and proscenium, basically, a nice uh, archway uh, that you would have a screen sort of Within this, they, they made it all out of cherry hardwood, and uh, it's designed to hold your front three speakers. And then it put is very, in front very of it. pretty. It, it's a it, very in pretty. this picture. It looks yeah. great. Yeah, it's uh, sort of like a, a subtle Art Deco style. It is. Uh, there's uh, there's some very nice woodworking that's done up at the top there, and he actually is including his 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio screen from Elite Screens. It's acoustically transparent, and for the whole thing, so for the stage and this screen included, he's asking $999, just a dollar shy of $1,000. That's all right. Uh, so he's posted it on Craigslist, and the place to really look at this is over on AVS Forum. If you come to avrant.com, we will have a link to uh, to the things that we talk about, and one of them will be his post on AVS Forum. They have a classified section over there, and uh, you can message him there on AVS Forum to inquire if you would like to buy it. He So he hasn't had any takers as of yet. He's hoping that maybe someone on this podcast will hear it or know someone who might be interested. So yeah, we're happy to help you out there, Justin. Hopefully you get that sold at a good price, and uh, yeah, very nice stuff there. It looks like quality materials and workmanship, so uh, yeah, looks For like a good sure. deal. So we're going to uh, skip over the news for today because there there really wasn't much time. I mean, it's July 4th coming up. Happy belated Canada Day, by the way, which was yesterday. Yeah. We're recording on Monday the 2nd. Canada Day was Sunday the 1st, which is unusual with, that it falls on the Sunday. So everybody had the holiday today on uh, on July 2nd, the Monday, the day off right. work anyway. I have several Canadians on my Facebook friends list and uh, I celebrated with them, you know, big thumbs up. 
for sure. I, I know it's fun, and then we have our fun holiday this week as well, our Independence Day on the 4th. That's absolutely right. So yeah, it seems as though because of that, uh, electronics companies weren't putting out a whole lot of news this week. Uh, but we did have a couple of comments just to get to real quick. Uh, Andrew T, he wanted to suggest to Damien from last week, uh, who was asking about if he should pick up some Paradigm speakers. He was like, well, if you're interested in Paradigm, there's a place called Canuck Audio Mart that I know pretty well. Uh, that's a little bit like Audiogon, but it's kind of like the Canadian version of Audiogon. It's it's basically classified ads, but specifically targeted at uh, at uh, audio and video equipment. Uh, but they set up a US version, US Audio Mart. And usually the things that are listed on Canuck Audio Mart are also cross post onto US Audio Mart as well. So lots of folks in Canada with Paradigm speakers. It's a good place to check out. So US Audio Mart if you're in the US, Canuck Audio Mart if you're in Canada. Okay. And uh, Roger J, he heard Infinite Gary's question uh, that was about synthetic versus natural fiber materials for rugs and carpets and things like that. And uh, Gary had seen the comment somewhere that natural fibers are better for acoustics somehow. Uh, well, okay. Roger is an engineer and he uh, recalls how many years ago <laughs> when folks yeah. were building speakers <laughs> and uh, stuffing the cabinets of those speakers with, uh, you know, insulation material to knock down the reflections inside the cabinet. At that time, it was easier to use like a fine wool, which had like small fibers and a very fine micro microstructure and that was good for converting the sound waves into heat which is what we were talking about and at that time the fiberglass insulation that you would get from your you know local building store or whatever tended to be like these longer coarser strands of fiberglass that uh, you know they had a larger microstructure so they weren't as well, it would be inefficiency if you're turning things into heat, right? <laughs> it, it, technically, yes. That's not what you're right, shooting yeah. for with a speaker. <laughs> you kind of want sound out of it. But it it was it was be, uh, yeah. The the wool did a better job of converting the sound waves into heat at the time. But these days, and this is according to Roger, and it. it clearly stands the uh, the sniff test. Uh, it's much easier <laughs> to find synthetic insulation that has a small microstructure and small fibers, and this is not a difficult thing to find anymore. So he suspects that whatever Gary read was probably, you know, either just it actually was like old information that's still out there, or it was somebody who was thinking back to that time. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, yeah. well, this is what it used to be, so I guess that's what it still is. But uh, th things can change, so. Right on. Yep. Oh, we don't need to go back to that. I'm fiddling with things over here on my computer. You and that's, that's okay, because I'm simultaneously worried that my audio is weird. Something doesn't <laughs> sound right in my head, and I'm oh. so paranoid that something isn't going to be... If I sound okay to you, and I'm not dropping in and out or doing weird things, then I'm fine. Things sound very fine right. on this call, so we're going to hope that everything's recording well, and that uh -huh. we're going to have a an audio-only version of this podcast to put out at the regular time. But uh, uh, yeah, soldiering on. So uh, as uh, Tom alluded to uh, last week when we were mentioning that Lee was going to be here guest co-hosting, we are going to delve into Lee's setup, but we thought what we'd like to do is answer some questions first. Then leave some time, make sure that we talk to Lee all about his setup. And if we have some time left over and some questions left over, we'll get back to them. If not, we'll wrap up the podcast with Lee. That's the that's the intention. So we're going to dive into right. our questions. We're going to dive into later my, my setup and my lack of a setup. <laughs> a little weird. Okay. <laughs> Situation is strange. All right. So uh, new questions for this week, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Martin D has a question. Martin has a Yamaha RXA3050 receiver connected to his Epson Pro Cinema 4040, which can accept a 4K HDR10 signal. Mm -hmm. He also has a Panasonic Plasma TV mounted on the wall behind his projection screen. Uh, he connected HDMI out 1 to his projector and HDMI out 2 to his plasma. Uh, his projector works fine, showing 4K HDR, but there's no video signal on his plasma. So audio is playing, but no picture. Mm -hmm. Folks on AVS forum said there's no way to get video working on both, even though they're never on at the same time. But what do we say? You know, possible that you can't make it work at the same time. I'm having all kinds of trouble like that lately. too. <laughs> so uh, honestly, it's a little bit surprising. So if you go through the manual okay. in the manual, it says exactly what I expected, which is, let's say you connect two displays, one to HDMI out one, one to HDMI out two. Right, right. And let's say you had them both on at the same time, which is not his scenario, but let's just, for the say sake of there, argument, yeah. say that it was. Uh, the manual says it will then send out basically the lowest common denominator, right? The lowest resolution and bit rate that is supported by both displays. Makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And that's it what, didn't exactly. at first to me, but you explained that to me, Rob, recently as we were talking about my situation. Right. So yes, makes sense. Yeah, so it's going to send out the thing that both 
displays can handle. It's right, not going right. to send out the higher level signal that only one of the displays can handle and the other one can't. So right. that that's what I expected to see. And so it's a little, I would have almost expected the reverse of this, right? I would have expected that his plasma showed up fine. And then what didn't show up was 4K HDR on his projector, which yeah, the projector yeah. can support it, but the plasma cannot. So right. that's what we would sort of expect. Now, because of that, it makes me wonder about a couple of things. So first of all, this Yamaha receiver does have video processing of its own built in. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you can do is manually set its output resolution to be 4K. And I wonder if Martin might have done that. It's not, maybe. not saying you necessarily did, but maybe you did, in which case it would go out to the projector that can support a 4K signal, but the plasma cannot. So and the audio would still be on. And the audio would still work because that's being separated from whatever source is being plugged into the receiver. It's separating the audio, handling that itself, then sending the video out. But if you've set it manually to output 4K, then that's only going to show up on the projector that can support it. It's not going to show up on the plasma that can't. So that's one right. thing to check, Martin, is whether you did that inside your Yamaha. Right. Now, if you have the Yamaha just set to pass through the video, which is how we most often have it, but not necessarily, uh, then I wonder if your source device has been set to output 4K as opposed to an auto setting. Now, the worry is if you set the source to auto and you set the Yamaha to just pass through the video or not do any video processing whatsoever, then the worry is that it'll do exactly what the manual said. <laughs> Right, you won't only, get 4K. And you, you won't get 4K. Yeah, which, so the way it's supposed to work is that when your plasma is turned off, then the source device should be able to see, quote unquote, or at least handshake with the projector through the Yamaha receiver and say, okay, we're all devices that support 4K and send 4K. Then when you turn the plasma on, it'll say, oh, now there's a device that doesn't support 4K, so I'm going to only send what it can support 1080p or 720p, uh -huh, whatever uh -huh. it can do. That's how it's supposed to work, but we've come across instances, several instances, where even when the plasma is in its standby mode, you know, you've pressed power and turned it off, but it's got its little red light saying, I'm in standby mode, right, right, right. that sometimes some source devices still see that device on the other end and go, oh, I can't send 4K. Uh, that's if it's set to auto and the Yamaha is set to pass through. So it's a little bit questionable. Now there's a couple other wrinkles to get to. The Yamaha has two HDMI outputs and you have the option on that second HDMI output to either have it just mirror the first output, in which case you run into that thing where it might have to have to go lowest common denominator, or you can set it to be zone two output, mm. which is an interesting case with the Yamaha because then it is sending video out of the zone two HDMI, but the audio is still coming out of the zone two audio jacks on the oh. AV receiver. Okay, why would it do that? Well, that's what some people want. Some people don't want any audio being sent to their zone two television because they have a separate audio set up for their zone two. So they want the audio to come out separate from the video in zone two. Right, right. But if you want to send audio and video to zone two, you can set up that second HDMI output as a zone four, <laughs> which has no like analog audio outputs anywhere on the receiver. Zone four is strictly the HDMI output and it would send both the audio and video to zone four, which opens up a whole new can of worms because then the audio has to be supported by the television. <laughs> Yeah. So all of these are making me go, the AVS form is kind of right here. There doesn't seem to be a good, solid, I know this for sure is going to work way. No. The theoretical is that if your source is set to auto and the Yamaha is set to video pass through or no video processing at all, hopefully it works since you only ever have one of these displays on at any given time. It's worth a shot to at least check those settings because that doesn't cost you any money. Right. But... If it doesn't work, then the only solution is you're going to have to spend some money to get an HD Fury linker. Oh, uh, okay. And, and the so linker, that will bring down the resolution and... That's right. Yeah, the yes. linker is a scaler that can take 4K and scale it down to 1080p gotcha, to gotcha. feed that to your plasma. So that way, as far as your Yamaha and your source device is concerned, it's sending out 4K all the time. Right. It's just that 
one of those 4K outputs is going to your uh, your projector that can handle the 4K, and the second HDMI output is going into the HD Fury linker, which can right. take the 4K, but then scale it down to scale 1080p down. Yeah, yeah. and feed that to your plasma. Now, that's a $180 device. That kind of stinks. But yeah, it, it, but that might be worth it to fight if if it's very important for you to have both on at the same time showing well, the same thing. Well, it's not even the same time as just to get the darn video working. Or just yeah, I guess to do it at all. <laughs> I mean, you you should if you're willing to just manually change your settings all the time, it should be absolutely possible to manually set either your source or your Yamaha to output 1080p. Clearly, you can do that in the settings, right? and then that will be fed to your plasma. It's just when it's time to switch back to your projector, you'd have to manually go back in there and set it to output 4K again. So that's a bit of a hassle, but it doesn't cost you any money, so we can get uh, that working. But yeah, if giving me flashbacks to, you know, a, a last week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, to now, actually. Still, so still. yeah, I'm sorry, Martin, that is not a super clear-cut solution. The HD Fury linker would let you have both displays going at the same time if that's what you want or not have to keep manually changing settings all the time. But it's 180 bucks, and I don't know, maybe you just want to save that 180 bucks and put it towards a new 4K HDR TV <laughs> to, maybe, replace, the, the to replace the plasma. But uh, then again, the only thing yeah. that replaces the plasma is going to be an OLED for most people. It, it, for me, maybe. definitely. But who knows? Maybe he doesn't. Maybe the plasma is only for lights on viewing at this point because he's right, got his okay. projector for when the lights. Are. We don't know. So you know, I mean, if you want a 65 inch 4K HDR TV for under a thousand bucks, there's that TCL six series for under a thousand bucks. Not too bad for a 65 incher. Or really? Six six hundred dollars for a 55 incher. That's pretty good. If I've gone looking at some TCLs and I wasn't impressed. Yeah, that's too bad. That well, Vizio P series then a little bit more expensive. Oh, a little couple bit hundred dollars more. <laughs> Just another quick check. I still sound normal when I'm talking quietly. Uh, on my end, you do. Okay. All right. Everything's probably fine. I, I, it's fine. It's fine. Just, just ignore me. You Everything's still have, good. You still have squiggles in your audio recording, right? Uh, yeah. There's plenty of squiggles, but it gets muffled when I get quiet. I don't know what's going on. Never mind. It's all whatever. We're <laughs> we'll good. Sort of, we'll sort it out in post. Sure. <laughs> I'll invent better sound in post. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I know that's probably not the simple answer Martin wanted to hear, but that's the honest answer, man. It gets kind of complicated yeah. uh, when you're trying to send different resolutions to different televisions. I know, and these right? things all have to talk back to the source. We didn't entirely foresee all of this. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the people inventing this stuff entirely foresaw nope. it all either. <laughs> yeah, I think we, one of the problems is we've gotten ahead of ourselves on some of this technology. Things are moving so rapidly and people want better picture quality as fast as they can get it. Yep, in their life. Always a race forward for sure. That's right. And, and these things don't always work out smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of miss the old yellow cable sometimes. Mm. Okay, moving on to uh, Rob W. Uh, when Rob installed his 25-foot HDMI cable inside of his wall, he took our advice and put it inside a one-inch diameter conduit. Uh, his display at the time was 1080p, but he knew he'd be upgrading to 4K HDR at some point, so he looked for an HDMI cable uh, labeled for 18 gigabit per second bandwidth, and he went with one from Blue Rigger. Uh, he recently picked up a new TCL 65-inch 6-series TV, as previously mentioned, and he's very pleased with it, uh, but he went to play his Xbox One S set to output 4K and HDR. Uh, there was no picture. Uh, lots of troubleshooting time later, he tried the short HDMI cable, and it worked fine. The problem was the 25-foot HDMI cable. Mm. So the uh, 18 gigabit per second listed on the Blue Rigger cable's specs apparently wasn't accurate. Uh, Rob tried one of the Monoprice Dynamic View active HDMI cables, and it works. Mm -hmm. uh, but when he went to pull it through the conduit in his walls, he discovered a problem. The HDMI plug fits fine into a one-inch diameter conduit opening, but he had some 90-degree bins along the way, and those are too tight to get that HDMI plug <laughs> through those turns. Oh my yeah. goodness. Uh, he resorted to using external cable raceways, which he says don't look too bad after painting, sure. Uh, but this is still all a bit of a disappointment, I can imagine. Yeah. Because you wanted it the other way. Uh, so he wants to know what he could have done differently to avoid these headaches and to hopefully help anyone else who is installing a long HDMI cable in their wall. Uh, is there a way to test HDMI cables for bit rates higher than any display you currently own? Could he have somehow tested the Blue Rigger cable for 18 gigabit per second when he only had a 1080p display at the time? Uh, I think probably not without some fancy test equipment. Uh, it's very frustrating that that should have worked. Yeah, yeah, you, you've got to have some kind of sync device on the other end. So, uh, I mean, 
borrow somebody else's 4K display is about the only thing that could be suggested. Uh, yeah, and to actually test 18 gigabits per second, you'd want to send 4K at 60 frames per second right, with a right. 10 bit signal because you need all of that in order to raise the bit rate all the way up there past what, well, I guess 4K at 60 hertz would be past what a 10.2 gigabit per second uh, cable could support even at 8 bit. Uh, but yeah, you'd want to send a big beefy signal, big 60 frame per second 4K signal uh, to a sync device that can support it. That's about the only yeah. way you could have tested that cable beforehand. Now, it, it really does stink, this whole 18 gigabit per second thing, because so we had HDMI LLC, which is the licensing body. And if you labeled your cable as an HDMI high speed cable, that was supposed to be the thing. That, that was supposed to be enough. Uh, HDMI 2.0 was supposed to be backwards compatible with high speed HDMI cables. But people found out that quite a few cables that had passed all of the high speed certification legitimately were not able to send the 18 gigabit per second uh, sure, signal. Sure. They, they couldn't do it. So they came up with a new licensing thing that was premium high speed. <laughs> Okay. Premium, so, yeah, they always keep adding an extra word or a letter. That's right. As if that's yeah. going to make any so sense. So premium high speed, not only was a new testing thing that, that you had to get, but they actually had a whole new logo with a little holographic sticker because they didn't want any <laughs> cable course, manufacturers. Of course, they had a holographic. <laughs> that's right. They didn't want any cable manufacturers fudging with the thing. They're like, if we label this as premium high speed, then it better darn well be. And it's supposed to have this little holographic sticker on the packaging to let you know that it's genuine and, and actually certified and all that stuff. Uh, the Blue Riggers don't seem to have that. They did just claim the 18 gigabits per second, but anybody can. Anybody oh. can do that, but you can't put premium high speed and have the little holographic sticker without actually passing the certification. Problem is, there have been reports of some that have the sticker, they're labeled premium high speed, and they still don't work. Right, so tell me, uh, am I right? All of this is still just copper cables. Yes. Carrying electrical signals. Yes. And either the, either the cable is built properly and has the right gauge, or it doesn't. And Pretty much. I, it, it, so... <laughs> That's what's so frustrating to me. Is it, it is it, very it frustrating. I mean, the, the, the cables can be certified because it's not as though they individually test each one, right? They, they yeah. build a, a spec, that spec gets passed, and then they say, okay, build all the rest of them just like this and you should be fine. But of course, there are manufacturing tolerances out there. So even some of the ones that do carry the full premium high-speed certified the sticker and all of that, in the field, there are failures. There, Especially there are when you some. get to these longer cables. That's uh, right. I, I bet you there are some... 15 year old uh three foot cables that could still carry a right. full uh 18 gigabit per second even though nobody ever thought they had so to make matters even worse um high speed premium the whole sticker and the certification and everything there is no way no there's nothing under hdmi llc to apply that to active hdmi cables mm -hmm. so on like these dynamic view that came from monoprice that work he tested them and they work in the field, but there's no way to get them certified because HDMI LLC doesn't certify active HDMI cables, nor do they certify uh, fiber optic HDMI cables, which probably work just fine, but there's no way to tell if they're certified. So that's why Tom and I have resorted to say, well, you got to look for them to at least say that they do 18 gigabits per second, but that's no guarantee because anyone can just slap those numbers in their spec sheet and claim that they do. Sadly, about the only ones that were like, yeah, if you buy this, it's going to work. And that's Blue Jeans cable. Because Those when, are expensive. They're, well, they didn't used to be compared to everyone right. else. But right, these, right. Days, these, days, these days, they seem expensive. And so far, everyone who has used the Monoprice Dynamic View ones or their fiber optic ones has reported that they've worked. So they seem okay. like a pretty safe bet. And the Monoprice ones are very affordable. So it's kind of like you go with Monoprice, one of their active dynamic views or their fiber optic if you need like 75 feet, or you go with, uh, with um, uh, Blue Jeans Cable who just brought out their own active version for uh, 40 and 50 foot lengths or, or anywhere. I think they have everywhere from 20 up to 50, I think is what they've got in those actives. So it's like kind of stick to those and that's about the best confidence that we can give to you uh, is to, to go with what we know works. <laughs> yeah, it's really frustrating. It, it, it you should be able to. It, it should be like speaker cable. It should simply state sure. the gauge and the distance, and you should right. be able to rely 
you know, on it. it you got you got 19 twisted pairs inside of there. That's a lot. And the, and the whole thing works on a, a timing difference. That's how it all works. You send the signal down the two twisted pairs. They arrive at the same time. That's a one. They arrive at different times. That's a zero. But it's happening at 18 billion times a second. You got to have a good <laughs> clock. Right. It's kind of amazing it works at all. Uh, no kidding. HDMI. I'm having my own headaches with it right now, too. <laughs> Again, there's another sort of like uh, best we can do answer. Yep. It's not, you know, there's not some quick, easy thing. Hey, buy this doohickey that'll test it. Uh, all those doohickeys that test it are professional and expensive. <laughs> so there's just no simple way to do it. Uh, let's see. I guess we're moving on to Earl B. All right. So Earl and his family recently went to a Dolby Cinema for the first time. All righty. Uh, the audio video experience was great. Uh, and his son remarked that he could feel the bass rattling his eyeballs and shaking his internal organs. <laughs> Might want to swing by the doctor after that movie. Uh, <laughs> check your spleen. It's very sensitive. Uh, Earl did a quick search to try and find out what subwoofers are being used and uh, how many. But instead, he discovered that Dolby Cinemas often have tactile transducers installed in the reclining seats. Mm -hmm. So now he's interested in adding some to his home theater. Uh, do the inexpensive bass shakers give the same sort of tactile sensation as a Dolby Cinema, or are they more gimmicky? Uh, if he wants the same tactile quality as a Dolby Cinema, what should he buy? Now, I think at this point, since I'm sort of filling it for Tom, I should have, make a snarky sound, kind of just start <laughs> growling at it. like. Uh, yeah, Tom's not the biggest fan of tactile transducers. Uh, uh, in a general sense. Uh, so I'll let you know, Dolby Cinema, uh, the ones that, because uh, apparently not all of them have the tactile transducers, but it's it's part of the sort of spec if, if you want to build a Dolby Cinema that you can have them. And right. they use uh, butt kicker brand tactile transducers. Notice uh, how classy that's. Maybe that's one of the things Tom doesn't like. If you're <laughs> going to name your product butt kicker, I don't know. You probably uh, drive a Camaro too. It could be. Well, they, they use the full size <laughs> versions, which you can buy for home. Yeah. Uh, yeah, now, the full-size yeah. versions uh, to buy at home, it's, it's definitely overkill for, like, a single seat. It's also it, overkill. Yeah, it's going to destroy your couch if you get the full-size Well, version. I mean, it's, it's overkill for even a sofa. It, what they were really meant for was to, like, go underneath your subfloor. Oh, yeah. Uh, so what I'm showing on screen, if you're seeing the YouTube video, this is the Butt Kicker Mini. And the Butt Kicker Mini is very much appropriate for attaching to one seat or maybe a love seat or something like that. They have a, a slightly larger one that they call the Butt Kicker Advance, which is very nice for a sofa, a three or four seat sofa. Right. Uh, but the Butt Kicker Mini is sort of what you want to go for. Now that, uh, the way the Butt Kickers work is they actually have uh, like a heavy weight piston that is suspended in a magnetic field. And that's the thing that wobbles back and forth. Okay. And it does a very good job of giving you the true subsonic bass feel. And it's very effective at that. And that's why Dolby Cinema opted for them. And why they're the ones I tend to recommend if you want to get it at home. Uh, mainly because you can set them... A lot of people do overkill, you know? They get really? these and they, <laughs> they crank them up. And unfortunately, quite a few people complain with the Butt Kicker Mini because the Butt Kicker Mini can bottom out kind of easily. Sure. Uh, now, it's a little bit counterintuitive because similar to a speaker, they tend to bottom out more when they have just barely enough amplifier power as opposed to having ample amplifier power oh, okay. where the amplifier is not clipping <laughs> and then you don't get as many sudden terrible clunk sounds out of the yeah, you know mini. Uh, so they can take up to 250 watts. They they require a minimum of 50 watts. And a lot of the times you'll see packages of a butt kicker mini uh, combined with a 50 watt amplifier. And a lot of people are getting them to bottom out with that. Now it's supposed to be subtle. What it's supposed to be doing is <laughs> recreating the same sensation that you would get from sound wave bass at reference volume but now you don't have to play it at full reference volume but st you still get the same sensation now the sensation of bass from sound waves it can be tactile for sure Hurricane. but it's not like kicking you in the back <laughs> <laughs> which well, you can i mean think about it. this product is called butt kicker i know you buy know. something called butt kicker you want your butt kicked and the, well, the full size something. one will do i mean if you All attach right. the full size one to one chair you can like knock yourself into the ceiling it's ridiculous <laughs> uh but the full-size one is also like 380 dollars or something like that and the the mini you can find for about 90 bucks for each of okay. them but oh. you need one one per seat so the most popular of the base shakers is the aura base shaker pro you can get them for about 50 bucks those should be attached to a 50 watt amplifier they, they really don't need more than that they, they can't really take more than that and 
And we're, are we <laughs> sending these things the subwoofer channel? Is that what we're? Well, I want to get into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, so I'll just first say that the the Aura base shakers. <sighs> Uh, I don't. I mean, they don't really give you the subs on it. They give you a heck of a kick in the thirty to fifty hertz range, which is where the kick drum is. That's where the brown note is. That's where we all feel it in our chest and our guts. That's right. So that's very satisfying. But when you're getting to the right down to twenty hertz and lower stuff, I mean, these work essentially the same as a voice coil in a speaker. It's just that instead of having a diaphragm that couples to the air and makes sound waves, it's just attached to a weight that shakes the thing. Right. Right. But. Down in the subsonic and the 20 hertz bass stuff, they they don't kick like a butt kicker. They just, they don't. And that makes them uh, feel a little bit more gimmicky to me. I don't want to, they're kind of cool, but I'm not wholly on board with them. So my, if I'm recommending to someone, if you want to, you said he wants to recreate the Dolby Cinema, all right? Yeah. So I'm going to go with that. I'm going to say, spend the bit of extra money to get the butt kickers. Go with the minis because the full size one doesn't make sense unless you're trying to shake your whole floor. All right. But Let's say you have three or four seats, which I'm assuming he does. Most people do. Most if you have three or four seats, try and go with... So Parts Express is a great place to get the butt kickers or the Aura Pro bass shakers if you want them. But try to get one of their beefier subwoofer amps. They have one, the SA-1000, which will deliver 1,000 watts into four ohms, and the butt kicker minis are four ohm devices. Okay. So you could do four off of that one amplifier, wire them in series parallel, so... Uh, two parallel circuits of two in series each. That'll give you a four ohm load total, okay. which is great. And there'll be a thousand watts for four of them, which is perfect. You'll have all the power. So you're spending a little bit more, but you wanted the good experience. That's what I would encourage you to do if you want the good experience. As usual, paying a little bit more right. helps. Right. Uh, but yeah, you, you asked a good question, which is about where do you get the signal from? And this is somewhere something that trips up people too, because... Uh, they give you in the butt kicker system just a, a Y splitter, right? And they're like, attach the Y splitter to your subwoofer output. Oh, okay. All right. And you send one end of the Y splitter to your subwoofer as normal. And the other end now feeds the amplifier that is powering the butt kicker. Seems to make sense. But a lot of us are EQing the signal that goes to our subwoofer. I was about to say, that's going to change the voltage going to the subwoofer, which changes the level. Yeah. Yeah. So... It gets a little bit tricky <laughs> because... As does everything. <laughs> yeah, because if you're EQing uh, your subwoofer output, you don't really want to EQ the signal that's being sent to the butt carrier. It's not meant to be EQ'd because no, it's, it's not interacting with the walls of your room. <laughs> no, it's not pushing the air around. Yeah. It's pushing your butt around. <laughs> So, uh, so unfortunately, I mean, what I, what I would recommend is that you output just a linear non EQ'd subwoofer signal. Uh, you send that into both, but then you'd want to separately EQ your subs, right? Which means you connect that subwoofer output to a mini DSP device, or if your subs have built in EQ. Now, the amplifier that I recommend, that SA-1000 from Dayton, it has a single band of parametric EQ. So if you're only doing like one EQ to your subwoofer output, I guess you could counteract that with the one, yeah, <laughs> one, okay. band, one band of EQ in the SA-1000. But it is a little tricky. And a lot of people who are reporting this bottoming out of the butt kickers, I'm like, are you sure that's not because you've got the EQ'd yeah. signal from your subwoofer output as well? Yeah. Well, how, how, what's the right way to get a non-EQ'd subwoofer out of your out of your receiver and get the eq that you want going to your actual subs that that there's just can't, not a good way it can't really be done because even if you have yeah. uh like let's say odyssey multi-q xd32 with sub eq ht which has dual independent subwoofer outputs they're independent as far as volume and distance settings go but not the eq but not the eq it applies uh -huh. the eq to both of them equally so really what you got to do is is eq your subs outside of your av receiver to uh -huh. set it up with a butt kicker in in the way that i would recommend doing it so this starts to become a little bit of a pricey thing although i mean a mini dsp is only 100 bucks sure. and it could do fantastic eq for your sub so but something else to keep in mind but then that mini cost. dsp is a is a whole separate process now compared to doing it through your receiver that's that right you are now you are now EQing adding your sub in a whole separate process yeah, yeah. it's not yeah. a trivial thing to add these things in the in the proper way so you in other words you have to really love it you have to really really love it. <laughs> they are cool though <laughs> they, they are working I mean, nicely they're cool i'm not as grumpy as tom on that topic i, I mean when things are fun they're fun <laughs> and go ahead and have fun right that's uh, in my opinion all right uh ideally 
Ideally, Earl uh, would like to be able to uh, add tactile transducers to his seats with a wireless setup. Uh, what can we recommend on that front that won't introduce latency or negatively affect the quality? So that'd be just uh, equivalent to wanting your sub to be wireless. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I would do what you would do to make a wireless sub, which is get one of the, the wireless subwoofer kits. Uh, Dayton makes a nice one for, what is it, about 60 bucks, something like that, Sure. which is entirely all you need. You don't need anything fancier than that. Uh, okay, Parts Express has it for $68.88. Sure uh, that's, that's one of the least expensive of the wireless that we know actually works quite well. Uh, so yeah, you, you get a wireless link. Now, it does introduce some latency, about 25 milliseconds. You counteract that by adding two and a half feet of extra distance to your subwoofer output. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Because when you tell it that your subwoofer is two and a half feet farther away, it sends the signal two and a half uh, or 25 milliseconds earlier. <laughs> what if you're at a really high altitude? Really high altitude. <laughs> the speed of sound is different oh, at higher altitudes. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm not sure if it's different ah. enough to matter that much, but uh, come maybe on, calculate a little... it off the top of your head, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. I'm doing it at uh, at at sea level. At, uh, there you uh, go. So if I'm in Denver, it's ever so slightly different. <laughs> yeah, well, the speed of sound would be a bit slower because the air is less dense up there. Right. So travel travel a little bit slower up there. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that, slightly that's longer you... delay. Yeah. That's how you can counteract it. And since I'm recommending that you have outboard EQ for your subwoofers, uh, you don't have to worry that you're now sending a slightly uh, earlier signal to your subs because you can counteract that inside the Mini DSP by delaying the phase inside of the Mini DSP or uh, reducing the phase inside of the Mini DSP. I just want to meet. I just want to meet Earl if he's the kind of guy that wants to calculate his uh -huh. altitude delay for his butt. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you just Put it to three instead of two and a half. You're probably just fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so there's how you do that. So I would like to hear from him if he decides to go through uh, the trouble and if he likes the results. That mm -hmm. uh, that could be fun. Again, you have to be into it and love it, but if you do, it's, it's fun. Um, moving on to Bobby K. First, uh, Bobby wanted to share a couple of good customer service experiences. He had an issue with the spring locking mechanism in his Elite Screen's pull-down projection screen. Uh, they did a bit of troubleshooting that could not resolve the issue, uh, and then they promptly shipped him a new replacement screen from the U.S. to Canada with no charge or hassle. Thumbs up, good deal. Very happy to hear that, because we had a, a couple of instances where people were not happy with Elite screens, uh, so yeah. really happy to hear someone who, uh, now, still not great that he had a problem in the first place, but at least the customer service to fix, you know, get the situation fixed was really good in Bobby's sure. case, so happy I mean, stuff that. happens, and when you can call a company and they take care of you, oh, that's right. feels so good. Because we all expect such crappy service nowadays. <laughs> I do. A shame. God, yeah. I hate I hate calling any business in the world nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> and second, uh, Bobby bought a refurbished Marantz SR5010 receiver from Gibby's that came with a one-year manufacturer's warranty. 18 months in, the left surround channel started crackling. Uh, once again, some troubleshooting was attempted, but the problem couldn't be fixed. Uh, Marantz shipped him a new unit, even though he was past the refurb warranty period. So a big thumbs up for them. There you go. That's very nice. Also uh, very happy to hear that. Very happy. So duly noted. Uh, now for uh, Bobby's question or question. Uh, there's an Odyssey FAQ over on AVS forum, and it mentions that it is always okay to manually raise the crossover frequency after the auto setup has been run, but that you should never lower the crossover frequency from what has been set automatically. The reason given is that Odyssey's EQ is only applied down to the crossover point, so if you manually lower it, those lower frequencies won't have any EQ being applied to them. Uh, how strictly should that advice be followed, he asks. Uh, in Bobby's case, he's using four Ascend HTM 200 SE speakers as his surrounds and surround backs. Uh, they're on wall mounts that create a gap of about four to six inches from the wall. Uh, there's nothing around the speakers, and they all have a clear line of sight to the microphone during setup. But auto setup always gives them 120 or 150 hertz crossover. So he's been manually lowering that to 80 hertz. Because we ex could we explain all of this in greater detail? Wrong. Oh. <laughs> so uh, so they're correct. How much do you know about uh, Odyssey EQ's behavior? You're right. So so what's been saying there about uh, so there's a crossover that is automatically set. Now it's interesting thing that we sometimes clarify, which is Odyssey themselves are not choosing to set the crossover. They measure the response of the speaker. They deliver that data, and then the uh, receiver manufacturer decides how they want to apply 
the data that they've received and they decide how oh. they set the crossovers. Okay, all right. But once that has been established, then Odyssey does attempt to EQ only down to the crossover point. So it is not EQing below that, which is probably a good thing, because if that's the crossover point, you wouldn't want it to suddenly start boosting it back up to flat. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> you, it's supposed to be rolling off at that point, so they are not doing their equalization below the crossover point. Uh, yeah, so this is a little bit interesting, because the HTM200 SEs can definitely play lower than 120 hertz. Perfect. Um, they're spec to play down to, what is it, about 60 or 65, I believe, mm -hmm. um, as their, as their native negative 3 dB point. So this is making me think that, so when the auto setup is being run, it's just looking for where the speaker hits minus three or sometimes minus six, depends on what the receiver manufacturer has decided to take as the point that they decide should be the crossover. But it's usually just looking for the minus three or the minus six decibel point, uh, versus the average. And it says, aha, that's where I'm going to set the crossover. Uh, which means that if you have some sort of sound wave cancellation anywhere, uh, you know, the speaker itself is capable of playing lower, but you're getting a sound wave cancellation at some point. And he says sometimes it's doing 120, sometimes it's doing 150, which makes me think maybe he has a cancellation somewhere on like 135 or something. Right, like he's that. having a hard time picking. It's like me and my contact lenses. I've got one eye that's 1.75 and right. one eye that's two now, and it's driving me insane. And the auto setup does set the surrounds and the surround backs as pairs, and it goes by whatever individual speaker out of that pair has the highest crossover point that it okay. detects. Okay, all right. Um, so it's not necessarily that all four of these are having this problem, but two of them are. <laughs> one of your surrounds and one of your surround backs, at least, is having this issue. He said you got nothing around him, clear line of sight. That's generally good, but maybe you need some absorption behind your surrounded surround back speakers because uh, it would be a boundary effect where mm -hmm. you're getting some sort of cancellation. Uh, so some absorption placed behind those surrounds and surround backs might be able to get it so that it isn't detecting this sound wave cancellation, at least not as, as strongly enough to set the crossover that high because it shouldn't have to. But let's put all of that aside. What if you just go, I know my speakers can play lower than 120. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Odyssey's not necessarily correcting, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Not the end of the world, really not the end of the world. Um, if you looked at it on a graph, like you measured it with a measurement microphone and looked at it on a graph, might not be as perfectly smooth on that graph as you want it to be. But this is something that might come up if we get to it later. I, I want to encourage everyone, even the people who are super geeky and into this, I want to encourage you to ultimately go by your ears. Yes, and, always. And play sweeps, play sweeps at yeah. the end of it. And if to your human ear, which is so much less accurate than your measurement microphone and a room EQ wizard graph, you don't hear a gap between the speaker and the subwoofer. Or a weird peak or valley. And yeah, an obvious peak or an obvious valley in the response. It's that's it's, okay. it's your ear, that's what you're hearing. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay if the graph says, actually, it's five decibels louder here. I feel like, but I just don't notice it when the sweet plays. You just don't notice it. It's okay. Right. It's not, you're not going to notice it with content right. either. You know, that, that goes back to a thing that I think a lot of uh, enthusiasts in this area feel and worry about. Uh, am I hearing what yeah. I should be hearing? Well, if you're not hearing the bad thing or you are hearing the right. good thing, it's you. The stereo is for you. <laughs> your TV is your TV. Do you like it? <laughs> then it's right. Yeah. So a lot of people do worry, though. It's like, man, I sure do like my system. I wonder if I'm missing something. Right. Yep. So I, I definitely don't agree with strictly following. You must never set it low. No, I don't agree right. with that yep. at all. Uh, if you do it and you have a problem, though, well, that now you know you have a problem and you probably sure. want to put it back up to where it set it. Yeah. yeah. That's like in my case, I didn't like how much bass I had. I added more bass. There you go. I don't care if it's not accurate. I That's liked right. it. That's and it's right. my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your answer there. Put it down. See if you like it. It's that simple. <laughs> uh, Eli M on Twitter had a question. Uh, if you have Dolby Atmos upward firing modules, uh, say the Pioneer Andrew Jones ones that aim up at the ceiling, could you mount them on your ceiling and use them as regular direct firing? Uh, what crossover should be set if using Atmos modules as regular surrounds or ceiling mounted overhead? Yeah, good question. Um, so... The simple answer is yes, you absolutely can mount them on your side wall or on your ceiling and use them as regular direct firing speakers. In fact, companies like Klipsch and Kef 
Uh, they have their upward firing Dolby Atmos modules and they explicitly say, I mean, not even in their manuals, right on their website, they're like, yeah, go ahead and use these as surrounds mounted on your sidewall. They work totally fine. As now, surely speakers. the response curve is going to be different if it's not bouncing off your ceiling. So most of the different response curve for that head related transfer function to help fool your brain into thinking a sound that was starting at ear level, but then going up and coming back down to fool your brain into thinking it was just coming from overhead. Most of that is happening in the AV receiver. In the oh, AV okay. receiver, when you tell your AV receiver that you have Dolby Atmos enabled upward firing speakers, uh. it applies this big head related transfer function curve to it. So most of it is happening in your AV receiver. Now they say, uh, uh, Dolby claims, and they've never released this. It's all patented and, and, and trademarked and all the rest of it. And they haven't of released course. the information. You can't really tell, but they say that the curve is meant to work hand in hand with the crossover that's built into Dolby Atmos upward firing speakers themselves. Okay. But Klipsch and Kef both passed that with flying colors. And then they both explicitly say, yeah, go ahead and put them on your sidewall and use them as regular surrounds. It's okay. fine. <laughs> but it just, it does seem to me like if you uh, tweaked them for bouncing off the ceiling, that's a very different response curve than coming straight to your... Yeah, but it sure seems like that's happening in the AV receiver for the okay. most part. And also, um, just logically speaking, it seems like a speaker intended to bounce up off your ceiling <laughs> should be very directional. Well, that is one thing. So like in the case of Kef, they have their concentric drivers, which gives right. you pretty good directionality. In the case of Klipsch, they have their horn loaded driver, which gives you pretty good directionality. In the case of Pioneer from Andrew Jones, he's also using a concentric driver uh, to give you that directionality. If you were using something like PSBs, where they have a traditional dome tweeter and a traditional woofer, uh, they put a ton of foam around that tweeter to right to aim it, it yeah. to make it more directional and so, so that, that makes me think since often we've talked about you know, well in the past i think the trend was more to make your surround speakers more diffuse and now right. we tend to be aiming them straight at our head yeah uh, maybe that's why it doesn't make as much of a difference but it just does seem like two different jobs to do to bounce off a ceiling and then to aim right at your head uh, the, uh, so, I mean, the, the upward firing ones were to supposedly go up, uh, you know, bounce off the ceiling, but you, it's a good, it's a good point that you brought up. And these are speakers. So when we've talked about installing in ceiling speakers, your traditional, traditional coaxial in ceiling speakers and right. Dolby's recommendation and our recommendation is you just fire them straight down because they're supposed to be kind of diffuse. And those speakers are designed to be quite diffuse and have wide dispersion, but you are absolutely correct. These upward firing ones are not, these upward firing ones are designed to have more narrow dispersion. So in this instance, if you were to take what was designed to be an upward firing speaker, but you're like, I'm going to just mount it on my ceiling and use it as an actual Atmos speaker physically mounted on my ceiling instead, you do want to aim them at you because they yes. do have the more narrow dispersion. And it does so. seem like you want to play some billiards and think about the angles as you set them on top of your speakers aiming off the ceiling. Yeah. Thinking about where you sit. That, that would be my instinct. I've just, I'm kind of interested in that in the future one day. Mm -hmm. not worried about it right now. No, nope, that's all. that's all spot on. And then what crossover should you use? Well, in the case of the Pioneer Andrew Jones, they're meant to work with the crossover that happens when you set them as Dolby Atmos enabled upward firing speakers, which is 200 hertz, Okay, which is higher than most of your you know regular wall mounted surrounds would be. But they are meant to work with a 200 hertz crossover. Again, that makes sense. The higher the frequency, the yep. more direction. So that's right. That, that jive. All right. And before we move on, I just want to verify once again, I don't sound weird to you. No, I, dude. I can't hear myself. I'll let you know if you do. <laughs> okay, so plenty of sibilance, nice, clear sound. I don't know what's going on with me. I might need medical attention after this. Uh, moving on to Josh S. Uh, Tech Hive posted an article titled, Will HDR Kill Your OLED TV? Is, isn't that what it's for? Um, author John Jacoby posits that the higher peak light output requirements of HDR will shorten the lifespan of OLED TVs, and that, no, that's what they're for, uh, which claim to have a 100,000 hour lifespan, meaning that's how long it takes for them to drop to half of their original brightness. Uh, but that number was given before HDR came along. But John ultimately concludes that even if you use your OLED for uh, five to 10 hours every day, it should still last you five to 10 years. So it probably isn't anything you worry about too much. What are our thoughts on this subject? I'm here to tell you, I mean, my opinion, I've had a plasma for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And when I bought it, everything you ever read was like, oh, my God, the burn in, the burn in, the burn in. The whole thing is just going to explode and burn away. And it's going to be dark in three months. 
I, people were insane. And it is going strong. That TV looks fantastic to this day. I've never had a bit of problem. Now, granted, I don't game where mm-hmm. things are sitting there all the time. I don't leave it on Fox News or CNN all day long, so there's no logo. You know, When I watch a football, it's just on you know college football Saturdays, so I'm not leaving the ESPNs. All of that I don't do very much, so I've never had a problem with burn-in. And this is related to burn-in. I, I, you know, it, HDR, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, is mostly about points of light in your image, bright spots, yes, bright little, things, little lovely specs, specular little highlights. details. And uh, from my own experience, we can talk about in a little bit. I found that to be trust. What was amazing? I was staring at the light fixtures in right. HDR uh, uh, video that I was watching, and so it just sounds immediately stupid to me <laughs> to say that HDR is going to kill your OLED. That's like saying driving fast is going to kill my 350Z. It's what <laughs> we built it for. <laughs> so, point. I mean, I, so I want to give some credit because if you actually read the article, uh, pretty much everything John put into this article is, is correct. Uh, right. And, he, you know, he's, he's like, we don't have all the hard and fast numbers. We haven't had HDR OLEDs for 10 years at this point, so we can't do a 10-year lifespan test sure. on it. It may right? be different. That's- that's that's impossible to have done at this point. Um, so you know he, he puts in the things that there are unknowns in that, but so it's the headline, right? The headline is clickbait. It's meant there to catch it, but it's also I'll defend it a little bit because this is a question some people are asking. Yeah, yeah. And the one thing I wish it's mentioned, but it isn't um, emphasized, and I wish he had emphasized it in his article, which is that HDR in general is. Honestly, most of the time it's darker than standard dynamic yeah, range. Yeah, the whole screen overall is the probably screen a as a darker. whole. Because HDR with its fixed nit values, mm-hmm. uh, when it's supposed to be 50 nits, it's 50 nits. Whereas most people, most people, set their regular standard dynamic range televisions to actually be brighter than the industry standard. Because the industry standard is for a very dark room. Not, quite, street- not quite pitch black, but like 5 to 10 nits ambient light, very low ambient light. Mm-hmm. That's what the industry standard is meant to be. And most people aren't watching in that. So most people have their regular television set to be considerably brighter than yeah. the 100 nit peak that the standard actually calls for but hdr is like no i got fixed values man you tell me to send out 70 nits i'm sending you 70 nits not 140 yeah and it's up to you to make your room where you can see the nits you need to see (laughs) that's up to you gets a lot of people to complain i thought hdr was brighter but everything looks darker also a common and valid complaint honestly but yeah so i mean what he says is that if you're watching hdr so you're going to have these little highlights that are for five, six times brighter than 100 nits used to be or whatever it is, right? You have these little specs, but they're a tiny little portion of the screen. They're certainly not the the whole five hours all forever, right? So even if you assume that it is shortening the lifespan of some of those little pixels, uh, you know, overall, it, it's very, very little. So yeah, he concludes, really nothing to worry about. I will also tell you, really nothing to worry about. And I wish he had emphasized that HDR is actually tends to be darker than SDR for most people, but uh, but it is in there. He did mention it, so that's okay. Sorry, I was just, uh, I had to respond with a text message to my dad. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't know <laughs> about podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so uh, HDR will not kill your OLED TV. There you go. No, no. That's dumb. Uh, but but a good question because I can see why people get nervous. Oh, absolutely. And because for a lot of people, they have equated HDR equals brighter. And it just, right. l- little teeny bits of it are brighter. That is true. Yeah. But it's, not it, the image it, as a whole. It's greater range. Yes, that's right. From dark to light. Uh, Nick B. Nick liked our suggestion from a couple of weeks ago uh, of using multiple smartphones and or tablets along with multiple small measurement microphones so that he could look at the frequency response at several seating locations all at the same time. Uh, between him and his wife, they've got two iPhones, an iPad, and a laptop. So that seems like the perfect starting point. Uh, yeah, and especially in my head, I'm thinking if the if you have the same sorts of iPads and iPhones, they probably do have mm-hmm. the same microphones in them with the same response curve. That would make a difference. Uh, if calibrated similarly, uh, we mentioned the Mic WI436 that's available from Cross Spectrum Labs. Uh, since each mic is individually calibrated and calibration files are provided. What app would he use on his phones and tablet, and how would he load those calibration files? So the answer for that uh, actually comes from one of the other 
microphone options, uh, the much less expensive microphone option, which is Dayton's IMM6. Okay. Uh, now, the Dayton IMM6, um, it comes with a calibration file for each one of them that they sell you. And uh, that you load into a program. So over at Parts Express, if, uh, which is the place that I would send you to to buy the Dayton Audio IMM6, mm. uh, they actually describe exactly how to do this process. Uh, for iPhone, it's an app called Audio Tools, which is made by a group called uh, Studio 6 Digital. And it's a pretty involved process that I'm not going to go through here on the podcast because you can read it and we'll have a link to the place where you can read it and it is very involved. Uh, you do have to have a computer. So you will take the calibration file that they send to you. You put that into your computer. Your computer and your iPhone must both be attached to the same Wi-Fi network uh, okay. so that they can communicate with each other. And then through the app and through the thing that you do on your computer, there's a way to send the calibration file over there. Now, it would be the same thing that you would do for the one that you might get from Cross Spectrum Labs. Now, there's a big, big difference in price because you can get the Dayton microphone for sixteen twenty five, or if he might be buying four of them, they'd be fourteen fifty for buying in bulk. Right. Pretty inexpensive. Uh, whereas the uh, ones that Cross Spectrum Lab sells are one hundred and thirty dollars each. Ooh, <laughs> now that's a big, big difference. <laughs> the big difference is that the Dayton mic goes down to they claim eighteen hertz, which is, in my opinion, still plenty. But the one from Cross Spectrum Labs is accurate down to five hertz. Whoa. So. I don't... Which they really only need at SeaWorld. Sure. I really don't <laughs> feel that that's necessary. And I mean, no. like, how many times are you going to do this? And your your goal is to get uniform bass across your seats. And I guess if you really care about genuinely subsonic that you literally cannot hear with your human ears, if you care about that <laughs> also being accurate, I, I, I find it really hard to justify. If you care about what you can't hear, <laughs> like I go ahead and buy those. I love Cross Spectrum Labs, but for this application i'm like man those dayton ones make a whole lot more sense to right, me right right <laughs> so um so for sure it will work with that now if you have android because he said he has iphones and ipads that's fine but if you have android there is also a tool that will work which is just called audio tool uh for android it's made by both in it corporation right. if you're looking for that uh so yeah so there are apps for android and iphone where you can load those calibration files and uh yeah i i think that was that question that, that kind of sounds <laughs> Fun, actually. So all, again, all these links are on the website for AV Ring. That's right. Uh, ideally, uh, Nick, <clears throat> excuse me. Ideally, uh, Nick would like to put each mic on a tripod and then have an extension cable from each mic to each phone or tablet. That way, he wouldn't have to worry about reflections off the flat surfaces of the tablets, and he could line up all the displays side by side for easy real-time viewing. Yeah, that would be kind of. Fun. Uh, so, what extension cable would he need? Well, Parts Express makes this very easy for you, because <laughs> yeah. if you look up the Dayton IMM6, uh, if you just put that into the search, uh, right next to it, they'll pop up a 3.5 millimeter extension cable. Now, it doesn't have to be the one from Parts Express, but it costs um, $1.16. So four of those really, really not too bad. Yeah, that's uh, not blowing the budget. <laughs> I'm not feeling well. It's a six foot one, so maybe you need one that's a little bit longer and it'll cost you a dollar thirty six each. Um, but <laughs> I, I don't think that's too bad. But you do need one that is a TRRS uh, cable, as a tip ring ring sleeve, right? That's one that's got the the three black bands on okay. that little three point five millimeter plug. So you don't want a mono one with only the one black band. You don't want a stereo one with the two black bands. Right. You want it's the not three an audio strictly audio. That's, right. table. It's that, table. that's really all you need to look for. But yeah, okay, they come up great. side by side at Parts Express. So easy. Perfect. <laughs> so that was a super easy one. All right. Another question. Different topic. There are several different auto EQ programs. Nick is mostly interested in either Odyssey Multi EQ XD32 or Direct Live uh, with 7.2.4 Atmos setups. Do these auto EQ programs apply their correction to 11 speakers plus the LFE channel? Uh, right. So he's looking at. Yeah, so this is just the EQ part of it, right? Right. He's asking, you know, Odyssey Multi-EQ or yeah. Direct. So Odyssey for sure does. I can absolutely confirm that. It definitely applies it to all 11 speakers and the LFG channel. Um, as far as I know, so does Dirac in, let's see that. Well, so the XMC1 from Emotiva doesn't have 11 channels yet. They've been promising that it would. You know what? Back since the Marantz AV8802, which is three years ago now, <laughs> they were promising that they were going to upgrade the thing to 7.1.4, <laughs> but still, still hasn't happened. They need happened. some sort of version of the promise ring for electronics companies that have lots of promises right. about what they're so, doing and not doing. 
there are some other companies like uh, NAD, NAD. They have Dirac in their receivers. I haven't used it. I'm not 100% sure if they do. Their, uh, to make it 7.1.4, you have to add external amplification because those ones only have seven amps built in. Um, so I'm not, I'm not actually 100% sure on those. Um, on the other ones like YPOW from Yamaha or MCACC from Pioneer or whatever, those apply to all 11 speakers. They're, okay. they're just doing their regular thing. So the EQ side of it seems to be fine. Yeah. All right. Uh, does Dirac have an equivalent to Odyssey Dynamic EQ? No. How about that? Really? <laughs> no, they I don't. I think that so... is a neato feature myself. I do a lot of watching when my wife's asleep. Yeah. And yeah, I don't want to a... blast things. Oh, well, that might be dynamic volume. Oh, dynamic volume. Well, I'm thinking about how the EQ sounds better, or rather is yeah. kept the same even as you lower volume. Yeah, because dynamic EQ, what they're doing there is, so at, at full reference volume, it does nothing. Right, right. Do, do, do the darn thing. It's only when you go below reference volume. Which is 99% then... of everything I do. Sure. And then what it does is it attempts to keep all sounds audible. Uh, so it's not like sometimes we've said it tries to keep everything sounding even, but that's not really the case. It tries to keep everything audible. Right. And as we've talked about, really low bass is not even audible to us unless it's pretty darn loud. Right. So dynamic EQ, it's most noticeable in the bass because that's where we notice it the most, but it's some other other frequencies and other positions in that that it does as well. Um, but yeah, it tries to keep everything audible. So Dirac doesn't have a direct equivalent to that functionality. Uh, it is entirely manually adjustable and everything that has Dirac gives you multiple uh, memory presets. Mm -hmm. So you yourself could set different target curves for different volume levels. That's something you could do. Oh. Uh, but it, do it doesn't adjust it automatically the way Odyssey Dynamic EQ does. All right. Do we know if YPOW does? YPOW has a thing that they call YPOW volume. I think, yeah. I think I even yeah. have that on my old Yamaha receiver that is <laughs> yeah, so so YPOW volume is an equivalent. Um, in the case of Onkyo, they don't have anything in their auto setup, but Onkyo's are THX certified, and THX listening modes come with THX loudness plus, which is a similar idea. Okay. Turn it below reference volume, it tries to keep everything audible. Would only be working in the THX listening modes, but that is how they get around it. Anthem has, um, they, they've deployed Dolby volume, and usually Dolby volume does both the equalization to keep everything audible and shrinks the overall dynamic range. That's the way Dolby right. volume usually works. But Anthem implemented it in a really great way where they separated those two things. So you can have it where it keeps everything audible without shrinking the entire dynamic range of okay. the thing. So Anthem has a solution there too. And Emotiva for their part, which uses Dirac for the equalization, they put in an equal loudness adjuster. So they did their own version of it, but wow, Dirac so itself doesn't do it. This is really... It's a bit of an art form because now you're talking about yeah. compensating for biological beings. Uh, That's right. Squishy humans. And you, yeah, so it's really an art form. And each, I can see how each company might implement it differently. Their own engineers sit in front of speakers and say, yeah, that sounds good. Our yeah. microphones or, say that or sounds Or they just good. load the Fletcher Munson curves from back in, was 1938? They made those things or something like that. Yeah. Has no one updated? You'd think. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's. <laughs> Speakers weren't as good in 1938. Anyway, uh, does Odyssey Dynamic EQ only get applied to the side surround speakers and the subwoofer output, or is it also applied to surround back speakers and Atmos overhead speakers? Yeah, so some people have reported that it's not doing anything to the Atmos overhead speakers, and that might be the case. The thing is, the Atmos speakers are so close to you in most cases, unless you have a really high ceiling, mm -hmm. um, that it's it, it just might not apply as much. But that said... Odyssey did all of their dynamic EQ stuff, all their research in that before Atmos ever existed. Right. So it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if it's actually not being applied to the overhead speakers at all. It is a bit being applied to the surround backs, it and it's is. actually being it's it's being applied to your front speakers as well. It's just that you don't notice it as much because our hearing in front of us is more acute. So there's right. a greater difference being applied to the speakers that are behind you because we need that in order to keep everything audible so we notice it more but it's being applied to all of the floor level speakers it's certainly being applied to the lfe output um or the subwoofer output in general uh but yeah it, seemingly the overhead speakers aren't being affected yeah okay so we don't know of anybody who's trying to put their own little art form on that yet no not just yet anything. yeah not that i'm aware of wow we're in the cutting edge <laughs> uh, do all auto EQ systems have something similar to Odyssey Dynamic EQ? Well, that's what we've been talking about, right? Mm. Uh, are they all basically the same or are there big differences? If so, what is different about each system and do they apply their correction to all speakers or just the subwoofer output? 
So we we mentioned the ones. I won't I won't go through them again. There there are several. They are there. I would certainly call them more similar than different, but they do tend to have different targets. Right. So Odyssey created their own targets, depending on the, the level. YPOW Volume has their own targets. Um, Emotiva certainly did their own thing with theirs. Dolby did their own thing with theirs. So <laughs> their, their, their targets are all a little different, but they're, I would call them more similar than different. Um, Odyssey lets you do a reference level offset so that if you want it to. So by default, when you're at zero dB on the master volume dial, it does nothing. And then anywhere below that, it starts applying its okay. curves. But you can set it so that it doesn't do anything at negative five. And only below negative five does it start to do something. Or it doesn't do anything down to negative 10. And then below negative 10, it starts to do something. Or negative 15. So it gives you sure. negative five, negative 10, negative 15 as options. Uh, most, I'm trying to think if any of the other systems actually give you that offset uh, built in. I don't. I don't know of any others that do. I do not know. Either. That that would be very tweaky, but I can see where yeah, off, just off the top your own of my, personal I, I, preference. I know people have asked for it, yeah. okay. <laughs> particularly of Emotiva, but so far not yet. So that would be the main difference is that is that uh, manual offset that you could adjust yourself. Okay, there we go. And that's all of his questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we will now move on to Nathan D. Nathan got moved up the waiting list for being able to order one of the, quote, last batch of OPPO 205 Ultra HD Blu-ray players. That's still kind of sad. That the last. <laughs> yeah. uh, he appreciates that if he were only using its HDMI output and only using it for movie discs, then even according to OPPO themselves, there's no performance advantage to the 205 versus the less expensive 203. So Nathan is wondering if there are ways to get more value out of the 205's analog audio capabilities. He'd like to be able to send signals from his sources into something like a mini DSP so that he can EQ the signal. Then feed the EQ'd signal into the 205 and use its high-end DAX to output the analog signal to his amplifier. Uh, but if the whole point is to use the 205's high-end DAX, he'd want to keep everything upstream of the 205 digital at all times, right? Uh, there's really not much point in converting to analog to input the signal into the mini DSP, having the mini DSP convert the digital for processing, and then back to analog for output, and then just feeding analog into the 205, right? Yes, right. Yeah, absolutely correct. That's yeah, you, you want to keep stuff it going on. all digital upstream of the 205. If this is what you want... Really don't think it's gonna make Doesn't an audible feel difference. Necessary. No, but no. Uh, but but for the sake of argument, let's call it an exercise. If this is what you want to do, you want to keep it all digital. Now, mini DSP does have products that they call their nano AVRs. The nano AVRs will accept an HDMI signal and they will take linear PCM audio up to eight channels. So that'd be like a 7.1 signal would be eight channels of linear PCM, all digital via HDMI. Then they can do their mini DSP stuff to it, still all digital, and then they can output it as HDMI, which could feed the HDMI input of your 205. And then the 205 would do the digital to analog conversion exactly as you wanted. So you can do this with a nano AVR. It just has to be that your source device needs to be able to output the audio as HDMI in PCM format. Okay. Because the mini DSP nano AVR is not a decoder. So you can't feed it Dolby Digital or DTS or something. You have to just feed it PCM. So it's up to your source device to decode it. Send PCM via HDMI, then you can do that all in the Nano AVR. And there is a Nano AVR with Dirac built into it. If you want to do an automated uh, EQ system using Dirac, all digital, be the Nano AVRs. Wow. So I'm starting to get that Tom face, and I'm going to start making Tom grumpy noises. <laughs> yeah. I really am. It's, it's coming. I'm warning you right now. Uh, another question. Uh, the 205 has the ability to decode MQA. <laughs> yes. Uh, files now, but seemingly only via its USB input. That's great, but once again, is there any way to get that to work with a mini DSP device in the signal chain? There doesn't seem to be a mini DSP that works with MQA via digital, nor a mini DSP that can take USB in and send digital out. So even if he sent MQA into the 205 via USB and used the 205 to turn that into analog, if he then wanted to apply EQ to the 205's output, he'd be sending it through the mini DSP's analog to digital, and digital to analog converters again, right? Kind of defeating the purpose of the 205's DAX. Any solution to this? Yes, quit, quit worrying about MQA stuff. <laughs> yeah, That's the solution uh, because, oh, I don't want to be mean. Oh, I'm trying not to be I, mean. I, I, <laughs> I consider MQA a bit of hokum, other than the fact... Oh, hokum is the sweetest word I could possibly think of. Other than the fact, though, there is the whole thing of if you give music producers 
a new format, that seems to be the only way to convince them to spend an extra second and an extra penny on audio quality. Because you can you can do all this with Redbook CD. There's there's no quality advantage to be had. But uh, you know, if <laughs> if they don't have an incentive to do it, then uh, then it seems to be a problem. So I'll give MQA credit on that front. Uh, but yeah, all of that is correct. Um, the only way you could EQ it in a mini DSP would be after the fact if you're using the 205 as your MQA decoder. So if you wanted to make sure that the 205 is doing the digital to analog conversion, the only real way that you could do that um, would be to have your source device decode the MQA. And again, you'd then want it to output it via HDMI and you could use a Nano AVR. I did want to mention on that Nano AVR, uh, it is an HDMI 1.4 device. So if you're thinking that you're going to send any HDMI 2.0 signals through the Nano AVR, that unfortunately isn't going to happen. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> that's one thing there. Now I seem to have lost sync with Lee. He is uh, he has dropped out of this call, unfortunately. So I'm hoping he might be able to find his way back in and I might have to take a pause to send a uh, tweet or something like that. Ah, and here he is. Uh, okay. Uh, so bear with me one second. I'm just sending a message to me. And so, yep, you're frozen on my end. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, carrying on. I did want to mention actually popping back to our last question there. Uh, I had some help from, uh, Mark F answering questions about Dirac. Uh, he had really studied up on it. So I neglected to mention that, uh, back when we were, uh, answering uh, Nick's questions there about Dirac. So uh, my my thanks to Mark F for uh, for helping out with that. So he asks, uh, this is carrying on now with Nathan. Uh, are there any other ways to benefit from having the 205? Oh, has Lee rejoined me? I, I have rejoined you. I've seen fantastic. you now for the past 10 seconds or so. Can we see each other again? <laughs> I, I can see you again. That's fantastic. So we so both thought the other one went away. That's right. I don't know who got cut off. I still had an internet signal, so I, I don't know what happened. I kept on talking. I'm hosting this thing, so I figure that the people are seeing seeing me, if they're seeing anyone. All right. Uh, chug along, man, but now we're both back. Great. Okay. That's right. You know so, what happened? The MQA people shut me off as soon as I started complaining. <laughs> it could be. They were monitoring. <laughs> uh, so other ways to benefit from the 205, it has a really good headphone amplifier. That's, that's about the only thing I say is actually worthwhile on that thing. There All you right. go. All right, moving right along, uh, if uh, the internet gods will let us, <laughs> Infinite Gary! In Gary's Atmos setup, he sometimes swaps between his Revel Center speaker and his Dyn Audio Center speaker. Does he need to rerun Odyssey every time he swaps? And if he were to rerun Odyssey every time, what would it actually change? Well, it'd be advisable. You are changing an entire speaker. It has a very different curve to it. It's going to have a different equalization. It might have different dispersion. Odyssey does take into a, account right. the reflections in your room as well as the direct response uh, going straight from the speaker to the mic. It also does account for the reflections. So if you have different dispersion from your speakers, that's going to affect uh, the equalization as well. So it'd be a very good idea. It's advisable. Odyssey would tell you to do it. Uh, if you don't, you're not going to die from it. Nobody's going to get hurt from you not doing it, but, uh, but you should. Do we know why he does that? Has he told us in, in previous shows why he that's there's his certain content he finds one of them sounds a bit harsher or less detailed than the other so he swaps them around it's gary he likes to play i got gotcha. you maybe there's <laughs> one that serves all your needs out there somewhere you need to find just maybe, the right center speaker maybe. To make happy. uh gary has had plenty of professional video calibrations done uh the calibrators always put their light meter on a tripod and line it up at the center of the tv uh but in one of gary's setups he's positioned the tv quite close to the ground with his center speaker above it uh it's too low for a regular tripod to line up with the center of the tv height wise so would a mini tripod be necessary or can the light meter just be angled down so the light meters need to be perpendicular yeah uh, anytime you look up an image uh they're they're like right up against the screen they usually have almost like a little suction cup thingy that's uh that's pressed right up across the screen so they need to be perpendicular you can't just angle them down uh now when you're calibrating a flat panel display um you're you're accounting for what's coming directly out of the flat panel display, so you you could just temporarily sit the TV on a table. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you don't do have that. a mini a mini tripod or a really low stand to put the meter right. on. The, it's not you, like you light changes just because yeah, it's three feet lower. You, you can bring the TV to the meter instead of bringing the meter to the TV. That that go. is also fine to do. Yeah. All right. Uh, when Gary puts a disc into the disc tray of his Marantz SACD player, it fits snug with essentially no wiggle room. 
The Oppo 203 and Gary's other disc players all have disc trays where you can move the disc around a little bit. That's been my experience with most disc trays and yes. most players, yeah. a little bit of wiggle. Is there any benefit to the more precisely fitted disc tray? No. Is it just that it was molded differently, maybe with a tighter tolerance? Maybe. Yeah, molded differently. For sure it was molded Clearly differently. It was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, but there's the, the spindle that actually goes in and spins the disc. That That's what matters. The, yeah. the tray is just, it's, it's just holding it there so that it can get to the spindle. The so, tray just uh, gets it there. Once it's yeah. there, it's it's a whole it goes away essentially. Uh, Gary got a Sony A8F OLED. Those are very nice. Supposedly, it got its Dolby Vision firmware update back in April. He updated his Oppo 203 to the newest firmware that specifically mentions having added support for Sony's Dolby Vision TVs. But when he tried playing a Dolby Vision Ultra HD Blu-ray, the HDR10 logo still showed up on his A8F, not the Dolby Vision logo. What settings did you change to get Dolby Vision working? Yeah, so you do have to set the Dolby Vision output to what they call their player-led processing. Hmm. So there is a new menu within the Oppo players for Dolby Vision processing under the HDR settings menu. And you have to set that to player-led. Not auto, uh, not display-led, but player-led. Okay. Uh, like so that's who's going to lead when you're slow dancing? That's it's right. going to be the player. Look for that setting. Yep, yep. Excellent. Okay. Uh, and that is all from uh, Infinite Gary right now. That's so that right. wasn't so I, infinite. That was pretty easy. I suggest we cover Justin B's questions that we've answered in even 10, and then let's get into uh, get into your topics. All right. That sounds nice. Uh, Justin B. Justin was browsing the specs of some speaker drivers. He found one that came in a 6-inch version and an 8-inch version. They both claim the exact same plus minus 3 dB frequency range, they both had the same recommended crossover frequency, and about the only difference he could see on the spec sheet was that the 8-inch version had 100 watts high maximum power handling. So what would be the reason for choosing one over the other? What advantages, disadvantages, would come from using the 8-inch version instead of the 6-inch version when they're seemingly so close to being the same on paper? Now, immediately I'm suspicious because okay. it, it seems hard for me to believe that if the only difference is a different, larger driver, why wouldn't that play a little bit lower with the same accuracy? I just, it's so unusual. I guess it's possible, but it's just so unusual. Yeah, no, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to play lower. Um, I mean, he did mention it is able to handle 100 watts more power. So that's, yeah. that's a difference that he spotted immediately. Uh, but you also, what, what we're remembering is that the 8-inch diameter driver is coupling to more air. It is displacing more air. Mm -hmm. With the same amount of travel, the same amount of in and out travel, it is displacing more air than the six inch version of this driver. Sure. So if everything else is equal, and it seems like everything else is equal, at least on paper, it should be a little bit more sensitive in that the same amount of power going in results in the same amount of forward to back movement, but it's coupled to more air, so it produces a little bit more pressure. It's right. displacing that much more air. It should be a little bit more efficient than the six inch diameter driver, all else being equal. And then on top of that, it has higher power handling. So all of that tells us the eight inch version should be able to play louder. Yeah. That that all adds up, and that's exactly what we would expect. But not uh, necessarily also, lower? Not necessarily lower, no, sure. because lower is a function of how quickly it's able to move back and forth. Uh, or how slowly it's able to move Whoa, back and yeah. forth. Um, so it, it's not necessarily going to play lower, or, or it could also be the fact that since its maximum output is higher, the point at which it's three decibels quieter is ultimately the same. But huh. it's three decibels quieter, but that's still louder than the output of the six inch. You get that? Uh, okay, <laughs> so, yeah, so relative to itself. Relative to itself, it's three decibels quieter, right. but overall, it's, it's louder, louder than, than the, the other inch. one. Okay, yeah. all right, all right. That actually makes sense. Yeah, so there, you'd ex also expect a little bit of difference in the dispersion. Um, when you have a wider driver, that means that uh, it will start to become directional at a lower frequency than the smaller driver. Okay. So you have to think of how large is the driver relative to the uh, wavelength of the sound it's producing. And once the diameter of the driver is one quarter of the wavelength, it starts to make that wavelength directional instead of very wide in its dispersion. It starts to narrow the dispersion so once the bigger woofers would need higher crossover frequency. Uh, so a bigger a bigger woofer, no uh, lower would need lower lower yeah, yeah. bigger yeah. woofer would need a lower crossover frequency. Yeah. Okay. To avoid it becoming directional, sometimes you want it. it to become directional. Maybe you do. Yeah, if you're doing an Atmos speaker, you do. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so that answers that. He'd like to be able to use a pair of speakers at his computer desk. Yes. Uh, he uses headphones at the moment, but he'd prefer it if he didn't have to wear them all the time. I gotcha. So for near-field listening like this, are coaxial speakers the best idea? Uh, would having the tweeter right in the center of the woofer ensure the best thumbing of the two drivers and the most even dispersion? Or should he be looking for something with very narrow dispersion like some ribbon tweeters? No, I can tell you from studio experience at radio stations that you really never see coaxial speakers in editing environments, at least not in the radio world. Although I, you certainly can use them. You like, can, uh, yeah, be Ke fun. Kef's LS50s are fantastic yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for near field monitoring. But it's not necessary. No, it's not necessary. Yeah. And there's also, I want to mention, there's a difference between coaxial and concentric. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, coaxial just means they share the same axis. They are coaxial. Right. Uh, so that usually means the tweeter is in front of the woofer, but mm -hmm. its its axis is in the same center. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas concentric means that the tweeter is embedded right into the middle of the woofer. So okay. th those can be a little bit different. So it's the concentric drivers that give you the very uniform dispersion, which is like what Kef makes or what most of the speakers that Andrew Jones designs, but coaxial can actually have quite a few problems, especially in intermodulation distortion. Uh, that's quite common when the tweeter is, is sharing the same center as the woofer, but it's actually separate from it, either in front of or behind it. Uh, you, you can get some issues with that sometimes. Well, fortunately, when you're like sitting at a computer editing, you're usually sitting with your head in the same spot all that's the right. time. So dispersion is not as... It's not know. usually... a usually a big concern. So I, I certainly wouldn't limit myself to only coaxial or concentric speakers, and I would not limit myself to only right. ribbon tweeters either. Uh, oh, no. uh, everything's on the table here. Right. Yeah, whatever you like the sound of, uh, I have two speakers that are really more large bookshelf speakers sure. in my situation, and then I have a subwoofer at my feet, and it all works yep. really well. Uh, do we have any near-field computer desk speaker suggestions? He'd be willing to pair them with a sub. Man, if this podcast was happening tomorrow, I might have a recommendation because I just ordered and they're sitting in the kitchen right now uh, and they're going to stay in the kitchen. I wanted a good pair of speakers in there because we cook a lot and we mm -hmm. listen to a lot of music while we do stuff like that. Uh, Canto uh, is the brand name okay. of, of a speaker that I saw recommended highly for small sort of near field speakers. They're kind of nice. They had a good look to them, density, kind of like they're heavy, good, strong magnet. Uh, mm -hmm. And they come in uh, like a, three, four, and a six inch woofer, or a four, five, six. Anyway, I got the, the Canto YU4. Now I'm hoping they're good. Don't know yet. <laughs> they were about $200. No, 250. They were 250. And uh, we'll see. Man, I wish All I right. could tell you. I wish I'd gotten them a day earlier. I'd have, I might have a recommendation for you. Well, there's some there's some different price points to be sure. I mentioned the Kef LS50s. Those those are those would be a fantastic choice, but they're uh, they're a little spendy. Um, the the passive versions that require an amplifier are what are they about fifteen hundred dollars a pair, and then the Ooh. the power self powered versions I think are up around two thousand. I think uh, I think that's where they are. Yeah, really nice but expensive. So the ones I like to recommend most uh, go for two hundred fifty dollars. Similar, uh, and those would be the Audio Engine, the uh, A2 mm -hmm. Pluses. If you're watching YouTube, I'm showing them in the fancy red color that you can get, but they come in black and, and white. By the as way, well. that Audio Engine uh, is extremely similar to the Cantos I bought, but the Cantos sure. have larger woofers for the same money and higher power handling. Uh -huh. And if it matters to you, they have a Phono preamp built in. Oh, okay. And, and they also have Bluetooth, and they've got optical, and they've got RCA, and they've got 3.5 mini. Okay. You, you can plug anything into them, and, and uh, you know, so if they sound as good as they, some people say they sound, then uh, they might be a better value than Audio Engine. I don't know. Could be. Hopefully. Fingers hope crossed. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I but I will, I will vote for the Audio Engine A2 Pluses, and they do, on mm -hmm. the back of them, have a line output that you can attach directly to a subwoofer. So that's yes. a handy thing. Uh, now, we've heard from a number of people who really like the Vanitu speakers. I haven't used them personally. The Van Vanitu Transparent Ones go for $500 a pair and actually have a dedicated subwoofer output uh, on the uh, back of them. Uh -huh. They also have this neat little passive radiator on the back of them as well. Uh, but they have a less expensive one that's $360 a pair, uh, the Vanitu Transparent transparent zeros it's actually been kind of hard to find the transparent ones right now i think they're waiting on a on a boat from china to bring more stock yeah. um but the transparent zeros are available they have a kind of a interesting design where you can set them up either sort of angled upwards or you flip them over and right. uh and they can uh or they have a little kickstand that kind of comes down and you can set them set there aiming straight ahead but they also have a dedicated subwoofer output right yeah. on the back same of them. with the cantos that i have sitting in the kitchen right now subwoofer yeah. output and you can buy 
a little thing is like fifteen dollars. They have stands that are meant for the point up or down. So if you just add a few dollars. Yeah, so a few a few different options there at a few different price points, but uh, you'll notice none of them other than the LS fifties way up there at fifteen hundred bucks a pair uh, were concentric or coaxial or ribbon tweeters. These, these are all two way speakers with with nice little drivers, but they sound good. Right, very conventional uh, shape and setup. Uh, anyway, uh, moving on to Terry G. Oh, we're, well, no, we, we decided to stop here. We're going to move on to a fellow named Lee Overstreet. All right, we'll move on to me. That's, <laughs> that's what we're going to do. Yeah. All right. Then I will scroll down to the Lee Overstreet <laughs> section. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to read your own words back. You, you can talk at will. I was All just right. putting this in there so that hopefully we don't miss any of the things you well, wanted I'll, to talk about. I'll just tell the story, which Let's. will reveal all the technical information and, and answer the questions. So, uh, and by, by the way, as I begin this, thank you again, Rob, because uh, I just n hit you up with so many questions. <laughs> you know, like Twitter direct messages aren't normally six paragraphs or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> not quite what they envisioned, I don't think. Right. It's not what they were thinking. It's definitely not a 280 character limit on that. <laughs> and uh, I was, we were going back and forth and I appreciate it so much. You're but very welcome. Our situation is we're sitting here at home at, with a lot of old stuff. Not ruining our lives, but we're like, you know what? I know there's better. Uh, our, our plasma's from 2005. Bless its heart. It still looks great. You know, it's still doing its job. Oh, We've yeah. got a 2006 uh, LCD flat screen high def TV from Sony in the den, which is right on the other side of the same wall from the plasma. And then we've got some old speakers in the kitchen. The Literally, they're like, uh, oh, what is the brand name? Altec Lansing. Oh, yeah. uh, and they're from 1996, and they were meant for a computer in 1996. They were 2.1, so they look very beige and ugly, and they don't <laughs> sound great. They got a weird response curve, and they're just kind of a little muddy, but they're good. They're, you know, you can jam out uh, while you're cooking. That's great. Uh, but it was time to upgrade several things, and my wife was kind of sick of having to turn on the PS3 to do Amazon Prime, which is okay. what we had set up. And uh, she knew that, combined with the fact that I've been itching for an OLED, we're like, maybe it's time. And uh, Best Buy kind of got us. We went in there and it was $2,300 <laughs> instead of $2,500 for the B7A. And yes. I believe that's what you have. Yes, Rob? Uh, I've got a B7P. B7P. So very okay. slightly different, but uh, essentially the same. Well, this was a B7A. Yep. And so, you know what? We're like, YOLO. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. And uh, so, long story short, we got that thing home and there are things I like and things I really don't like. Okay. Uh, so, the... The things I liked were, of course, the picture quality. Come on. Okay. I, I think, you know, what I was looking at is about as good as television is going to get in your home right now. I think. Am I wrong? How much better can it get? In my opinion, it's it's the tops. That's that's I that's think, what yeah. I that's why I recommended them. <laughs> that's why we're you're kind of maxed out once you get to any of yeah. these LG or Sony OLEDs. They're the same panel, right? They're all uh, manufactured by LG Display. Yeah. Right, right. All, now, all the Sony, big OLEDs out there are there, yep. Yeah. I'm starting to wonder if Sony maybe is a little more picky uh, and maybe they reject more. And, you know, I know they they have a different computer in there and maybe their processing yes. can compensate for anything that the, the panel can't quite do perfectly. Uh, so that picture quality was amazeballs, as the millennials <laughs> say. OK, <laughs> right. But that everything else I kind of didn't like. Oh, OK. OK. Like I was super annoyed at the remote. Okay. I just, this, the remote and the way it operated in the menu systems was like Fisher Price is my first remote. <laughs> it was like for children or something. I kept looking in the box, like, where's the main remote? Like, where's the adult remote? There's and, only one. And there's only this one goofy little, I just didn't like it, man. It's I, a this, Wii remote. It, it, it is. It's move. a Wii it's remote. Yeah. I, I suppose I could get used to it. And I started to calm down about it. But at first I was like, I can't stand this thing. <laughs> I didn't like the menus. It's like, give me just a ugly Sony menu. Mm, okay. You know, I just, I just miss a bland left, right, up, down menu. <laughs> I don't need swishy, pointy, cute little like heart shaped <laughs> pointers that are hot pink on the screen. And I just I hated it, man. It just so it was getting my like when you want to do different menu things, there's a scroll wheel button in the middle where normally you'd find just like okay. Yeah. Like most most navigation on most remotes, you got left, right, up, down, and in the middle, okay or enter. And this thing has the wheel, and I couldn't ever figure out how do I get the little pointer up on the screen and how do I get it to go away? And sometimes you scroll and sometimes you pokey pokey and I just okay, Anytime so. you flick the wheel, the pointer will show up, or if you just wiggle the remote, the pointer oh, yeah. will show up. See, I didn't even know about the wiggle. Okay. Yeah, if you just anyway. if you just wave it, it'll show up. Or if you or if you flick the wheel, it'll show up. If you leave it alone, it'll go away. Or if you press any of the direction buttons, it'll go away. Right. Uh, yeah. So I hated the remote. <laughs> I hated the navigation. But I could get over it. I finally found most everything I needed to find. There was a lot of stuff new to me, and that was great. 
And I finally settled in on the ISF bright room yeah. setting. Sure. And I think I tweaked that ever so slightly. I was not yeah. far off of that setting to make me happy uh, for everything. So that, that was fine. The apps also drove me crazy. Okay. Uh, so, and I know you remember this because I went back and forth with you saying, do you see what I'm seeing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, for instance, the YouTube app yeah. will not play 60 frames per second videos on some 60 frame per second video. And I yep. think Rob determined it depended on the codec that YouTube decided to present to the LG YouTube player. Yeah, uh, yeah, because this this stumped me. But then, uh, so within the YouTube app that's built into the LG OLEDs, right. uh, if you pause the video, there'll be a little bit of text over on the left near the scrub bar. More options or something like more, that. More options, that's right. So you click on that and more options show up. And uh, it, it's all icons, so you have to put the little pointer over you it to see float. what one of, You gotta do the weave thing, wave right. your remote around. Just like your mouse pointer, but there's one there, for the, what is it, Stats for Nerds, right? Stats for Nerds, that was very neat. I had not heard of that until you told stats me about it. Stats for Nerds. In so you YouTube, all YouTube and, videos have this, by the way. It's not just on this TV. This is that's just right, something yeah. YouTube videos have. So it'll show you the frame rate and all that stuff. So there were there were some videos that were labeled as being in 60 hertz, uh, all different resolutions, 720p, 1080p, 4K, uh, labeled as being in 60, uh, 60 hertz. And they all played just fine and showed up in the stats for nerds at 60 hertz as long as they were in the VP9 codec. Just that but if, codec. But if they were in a different codec, even if the video was saying, oh, the, you know, we uploaded this, this is 60 hertz, it was playing at 30 hertz if it was any codec right. other than VP9. And that makes no sense to me because all I know to do, I, I took their recommended settings for all these videos I uploaded. I'm talking about videos I uploaded. I first right. noticed this problem with my videos that I made. It wasn't playing my uploaded 60 frame per second videos right. Yeah. And these are made from Adobe Premiere. They're MP4s. They're, they're as, as standard, as close to <laughs> YouTube's recommended settings as I could get and there's 60 frames a second they should play and they did not and the reason this is this particular error was important to me is because I want to be able to show the videos I upload on this TV sure. right sure, sure, sure. And, and weirdly this has to do with standard definition way back in the day so I take these videotapes I have these family videos uh, or these videos from when I used to do the radio show I've got high 8 8 millimeter and super VHS and VHS and all of these things I determine the best way to get the best quality out of them is to convert every field, remember it's 60 fields per second, each field yes. is only every other line, but if you convert each field to a frame and just double each line, you get a pretty darn good looking picture that looks an awful lot like how NTSC television used to look on a tube TV. Sure. To, to me, uh, I think we're all being misled. It's not 30 <laughs> frames per second. It Technically it is, but frames don't mean frames like you think they mean frames. It's really 60 images per second because yes, right. each field is taken one sixtieth of a second apart so yeah. you have a 60 frame per second image even on an old vhs tv if you do what most televisions do when you feed an ntsc signal into them they turn it into 60 frames per second so it looks like that's why the people call it the soap opera effect television yeah. is 60 frames or 60 pictures per second so anyway that was making me very mad that if i it, the, the problem is if you convert ntsc to 60 frames per second and then you only view it at 30, then you only get half the image. Yeah. You get half the detail. So it was ruining that. That made me mad. But like uh, Rob said, but, hey, it's not too bad just to stick a Chromecast in there in one of the HDMI. Which inputs. was one of the main things, which is that that, that is an app limitation. Yes. Uh, which means it's potentially it could get updated at some point. I, I wouldn't hold my breath for no, it. But I'm it, sure that if I email them, they'll be like, Lee Overstreet oh, sure said get his right videos. On it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, it, it is an app issue because we did confirm that via a different device, yeah. still playing YouTube, yeah. the television could display it. Oh, yeah. And YouTube could deliver it. In fact, it. It my just plasma shows it beautifully. At, yeah. Well, my plasma has to do it at 720p60 because it's a yeah. 1366 by 768 plasma. Yeah. But uh, it still does 60 frames per second wonderfully. And my old videos look great, just like I intended them. I worked very hard on making them look as good as I can. Right? <laughs> okay, so that that's one little limitation that might not apply okay. to everybody. But there's this other limitation, and this also isn't necessarily the TV's fault, but it's no surround sound on most Netflix and all Amazon Prime. On most Almost Netflix? Most Netflix was coming in at, at stereo. Some stuff was 5.1. I'm oh, telling you, not, right. not everything was not everything was surround sound uh, that ah. I thought should be surround sound. But anyway, so but the the, the thing that really annoyed me is Amazon Prime that yeah. uh, that everything was in stereo. That one is everything is in stereo. Okay, yeah. so y'all, I I've had surround sound Dolby Digital 5.1 
since 1999. Uh -huh. I'm not going backwards on my sound. And I'm like, okay, the whole one, not the whole reason. One of the reasons we're getting this TV is we want to have everything really slick and integrated into the TV. These apps are part of the reason I want it. Okay. Because yes, yes, yes. I'm not going to go out and get uh, Ultra HD Blu-rays very often. I'm just not. I'm not going to spend the money on it. And kind of like Tom pointed out, I, I heard him recently talking to you about my visit and how one of his Blu-rays froze up. He's yeah. kind of sick of discs too. <laughs> and when I saw the image quality on the Amazon Prime uh, HDR 4K, I'm like, what am I bothering with a disc for? But you have to bother with a disc if you want proper sound. Now, do you have, have you got your new receiver yet or no? I have not yet. No. Okay, because I'm thinking that on the so Netflix for sure, because Netflix is like the one app that they put all the effort into with the LG OLEDs. Okay. Um, right. And for sure, almost. I mean, there are some things that were just made in stereo, so they're in stereo. Right. But almost everything should be five point one. But I'm wondering if it's a Dolby Digital Plus issue because they're sending out Dolby Digital Plus maybe with their app. And I'm wondering if something is going a little bit awry with your older. Yes, receiver. you're right. In this case, I this is just purely unique to Lee Overstreet mm. right now. Because I thought I wanted to make sure the TV was good and then pick a receiver right. to match it. And yeah. so uh, I was using the old receiver, which means I had it run through a splitter. Yeah. But uh, So an but HDMI yeah. matrix splitter. I had a four in, two out uh, uh, monoprice HDMI doohickey. Yeah. And maybe but, that was uh, being confused. A Amazon Prime and uh, Hulu. But, you're, stuck with, you're stuck with stereo. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I take that back. Rewind. That's only for my cable box. Because remember when the OLED, I was taking the uh, optical audio out. Yep. To go into the receiver from the television <laughs> so i thought for sure that would give me 5.1 and it did for some stuff in netflix it, yeah. and other stuff i thought it should and it didn't so I'm it was thinking just a, a dolby digital plus thing okay might very well be so yeah. maybe that's not feeding over that optical but anyway but here came the big thing okay okay i was getting ready to get used to all that and just get me a chromecast for other situations and i'm like okay i can do some pro logic around decoding on this stereo stuff for a while <laughs> Because it's so beautiful. Until and maybe you get they'll... your HDMI audio return channel working with your new receiver. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, Amazon Prime, you told me that's mostly Amazon Prime's fault. Yeah. They're not doing ground yeah. sound on everything. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm like, okay, all right, I'll <laughs> get over that. But then came the blue dot. Mm. Stuck pixel. And literally just one? Just one, and one, I don't care if it's just one. One out of can't the eight point one. something million. <laughs> you cannot live with it. It might have been a cluster of four. It was bright as okay, all get yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might have been a little cluster. Bright as all get out. Mm. Okay, so once that happens, you run the pixel refresher thing a yep. couple few times. Pixel refresher. Yeah. Uh, you run. There are videos you can play from YouTube that flashy, yes. flashy, flash it, trying to like unstick yeah. it, which I think I is like hilarious. the one from Doctor Screen. Sure, there are all kinds of epileptic, you know, videos. They you are, can they run. Sure, yes, they, yes, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Do not stare at that, man. Do not. My wife had to leave the room. It was like, whoa. Okay, none of that worked, so it had to go back. And once we took it back, we had to wait a couple of days to get another one delivered. So we came home, hooked up the plasma again, and that's when we said, you know what? Hooking up this plasma again is not ruining my life. <laughs> well, no, it's not going to ruin your life. Okay, all right, I was just saying, you know, like we talk a lot about night and day differences. Mm, okay. When we when we went from, you know, a, a standard definition TV to that plasma, that was night and day by yes. a mile. I mean, we sure. invited friends and family over. We'd watch anything. Everybody's like, oh, my God, it looks 3D. I've never seen a TV like this. It was incredible. But, you know, going from a 50-inch plasma to a 65-inch OLED is great, but it's more like dusk to day than <laughs> okay. night and day, right? <laughs> okay. Like, your life doesn't change. And, and it's because, not that you saw no difference whatsoever or that oh, no. the OLED looked bad. No, uh, yeah, no. Trust no. me. I was amazed. When we, we watched, what was it? The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel was a really cute mm -hmm. show and shot really well on Amazon yep. Prime. And it looked phenomenal. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, I kept talk, talking like during the show. She's like, hush, because I kept talking about the lights. <laughs> like, look at that light fixture. Look at that light over there. <laughs> oh, it looked great, right? So, no, don't get me wrong. It didn't look bad. It's just that... Uh, you know, like back in the day when you got used to high def and you went back and had to watch some standard sure, def, sure, sure, sure. you went, ooh, it's awful. Yeah, How did yeah, I? Yeah, yeah. But if you go from OLED 4K back to your plasma <laughs> high def, you don't go, ooh, oh my God, I can't stand it. I've got to fix this immediately. <laughs> you kind of go, you know, let's just wait a little bit on the TV. Okay. Because here's the situation. Because of all those problems, I need to start over and let's start with the simpler stuff first. Let's, let's get the speakers that I hate in the kitchen replaced. Let's okay. Get, uh, let's get a receiver. Got to do that first got to get a good receiver and then let's get you know a tv in the den difficult too because tvs apparently suck nowadays 
<laughs> I'm telling you, I didn't think it would be this difficult, uh, especially for that DIN television. We want yeah. like a 43 inch. And I right. thought, oh, I'm going to run and get this TCL. Everybody brags about it. It looked like Dookie, man. It okay. Looked terrible. You I mean, the the six series is nice, but it starts at fifty five inches, so there's no forty three inch version. Right. So maybe but that was I, the I went for that. There's like S5. a TCL that's like three hundred something like that. Yeah, probably the S five. The S five. And there's so a Vizio right. that's like three fifty. Yeah, we Vizio E series, sure. And I'm telling you what, you you step one step off to the side, that picture's one. yes, 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 yes. That is. Oh, you're used to a plasma and an OLED. <laughs> well, no, I'm talking about my old two thousand six LCD. Now we're talking. We'll okay. Go around the corner and in into my den from my living room. And we're talking about the little 32-inch Sony from 2006, the LCD yeah. television. It's a backlit standard cold cathode tube, whatever it's called. Maybe it's an IPS panel, though. It they is. were more common back then. Now I know. I got to look for an IPS panel to be happy. Ah, but and then you don't who, get the good black levels. But you know what? <laughs> guess what's more important in that room is, is the viewing, the viewing angle. Because I'm okay, standing so in the kitchen, LG, which is then. off to one side. Right. But guess who also still makes IPS? Sony. Uh, maybe in some of the small screens. They do. Yeah, you're right. So the 43 yeah. inch size, uh, you can okay. get, but you got to go up to a 500 or a 650 dollar television at ah. that 43 inch size to get the IPS panel. And yes, the black levels are worse, but the yes. lights are always on in that room. Okay. We never turn the lights off in the den at the kitchen table. There's kind of a we have a dining den. Our dining table's kind of in this den dining room. Well, I know you were interested in the OLED because in your main room you were worried about the viewing angles as well, like off right. to the sides. Now yeah. in that room the lighting is much more controlled. It's subdued okay. all the time. We rarely watch in pitch black dark, but I did a few times when I had the OLED before the yeah. blue dot came on. It does get black, right? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> I watched some NASA 4K videos and I was like, yeah. okay, I'm starting to get like calming down about this. But well, I just like that when you're watching a Cinemascope movie, the black bars they are black. They're gone into they're that bar. border oh that's, yeah if you turn all the no lights off saturn is floating haze. in space and <laughs> that's it's beautiful right. so, uh so my experiences had pluses and minuses and in just okay. you know long long story that's way too long getting a little shorter here is just i'm gonna wait on the oled we're gonna consider the sony that's see fair. if they have any better apps or and, and you know your your whole thing you told me about to look for those sort of vertical bands yes the vertical bands uh, in the dark grays that's right, that I, I mean that that is the known issue that's the that's a panel issue yeah. That, that is just inherent to the way LG is currently manufacturing their OLED panels is in dark grays, you get some vertical banding, but from unit to unit, it can be much worse or much better. And it is, it's a lottery. You don't know. And right. it, even getting one of the most expensive ones guarantees you nothing on that front. And that kind of made me mad lottery. too. I feel like maybe yeah. they should be better at it. It feels like this TV was kind of rushed to get it into this world, to birth well, and it and to get into it to this, this price point. Yeah, it it's yes. part of the manufacturing process. About about twenty percent of them have pretty bad vertical banding that you can see during actual content. So eighty percent of them are good. Twenty percent of them, which is a pretty high percentage, are are outright bad. Yeah. yeah just to talk about the OLED again, forget my sort of DIN uh, LCD situation, but talk about the OLED again. Yeah, I, I did the gray test. You yeah. get down to about. I, I thought I could see something schmooey at forty-five or fifty percent gray, just something. And you Literally get down to about something. 25, definitely mm -hmm. you start to see this little kind of like, like curtaining. Okay. No like yeah. hard edge banding, but like this sort of, it looked like curtain. Yeah, uh, unevenness from, yeah, yeah. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't call it a uniform gray from side right. to side. Dramatic at 10%. Mm. And then at 5%, the whole thing just sort of went black. Okay. And so I'm like, oh, I don't see it in content. Maybe this will be okay. Yeah. But basically, I just felt too stressed out by that TV. <laughs> It, was just, it, it felt like, no, this situation is not ready yet. I was amazed uh, when it was working right, but it's like having that, you know, bad boyfriend. See, He's nice when he wants to be, you know, <laughs> this is a see, negative. The, the I the can change side, him, you know. The flip side is you get look at some of the highest end LCDs right now. You know, yeah. the, the Samsung Q9F, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, really, really I'm even more expensive than the OLEDs that one can be. Uh, yeah. Sony's uh, X900F, which overall is pretty darn great right now. Yeah. Uh, but those ones, they almost have the reverse problem. They tend to not, uh, some of them do have some banding in the dark rays. Mm -hmm. That tends to not be the issue with the LCDs, but they have what a lot of people call the dirty screen effect uh -huh. in the bright grays. Uh -huh. So in the bright grays, you look side to side and you see a little bit of, I mean, it's just Un, you wouldn't call it a uniform gray. It's right. uneven, and it's the type of thing where, let's say, you're watching hockey with the white ice. Yeah. Uh, as the camera moves back and forth, as it tends to do watching hockey, you see this non-uniformity in the bright gray uh, or the close to right. white, and it looks like your screen is dirty. It looks like you need to to, to wash your screen, but it's <laughs> not. It's just the panel. So again, I mean, these can be really expensive, and they are they are not perfect. 
they, they, this is true. They are not. I, well, I'll put it this way: we're going to go back to an old. We're, we're getting an OLED at some point. Okay. Okay. We're just putting it off for now until they're we make only going to continue to come down in price. So that is exactly. not a bad move. And so I, we decided let's wait, see what kind of Black Friday situation happens, or sometimes pre Black Friday gets pretty good too. Yep. And sometimes early December gets pretty exciting too. So we're just going to just chill and let's fix all these other problems. You know what? I am glad that you were willing to return it. I am glad yeah. because that is what you. That is. I mean, I've. I was, you can vouch for this. I was saying, buy it from a place you know you can return it. Yes, yes. Because if you have the vertical bands, it, I didn't mention a stuck pixel, but that, you know, once that came up, it was like, don't be afraid. Don't right. be afraid to return or exchange it. That's that's but what that you know, policy is Returning there for. is a pain Protect though. You. And I didn't want to yes. have to return a second one. On the day we returned Understood. that television, yeah. uh, my friend came over with a trailer as the only way to really get it there. And God tried to kill us. Like it was oh, storming that day, you know. It was like, oh, keep the television, you know. <laughs> so it was like it was storming, and we had to wait for a break in the clouds, and we wrapped the thing up in like a, a you know a drop cloth kind of paint thing, and uh, and and then like an hour after my friend left, a giant limb came out of the tree above where he was parked, smashed down on the driveway, would have hit his car. So like nature did not want us to return that TV, but by <laughs> golly, we did, and we're gonna wait. Okay. okay. <laughs> and so, wait, what was the other thing I was complaining about that TV? There was some. Oh, yeah, the uh, power saving feature. Oh, power saving feature. Yes, yeah, good. Like movie, it yeah. had this stupid power saving feature that uh, the, we, <laughs> the second, like, second it day we were watching default. it. Yeah, we, this is like LG doing something strange. And all of a sudden, we're both like, this TV was brighter yesterday. <laughs> what is wrong? And it's another thing that made us mad. And we discovered, we dug through the menus and we found power saving, turn it off. Boom, it's bright again. Yep. And uh, no, they got to get that energy star rating, you see. Yeah, I don't. I'm not trying to save power. I don't watch TV 12 <laughs> hours a day. Hit me with the light I want to be hit with. So, well, I'm not. I'm not sure how happy you'd be with the with the Sony version because everyone complains they use Android TV as their OS. Right. And everyone complains it's it's very slow and laggy to use. And right. Android TV, the apps for that have some quirks to them too. So. Okay, that's what I mean. I think everybody's trying yep. to get this technology as fast as possible to people because it is so amazing. I mean, it's truly amazing, and that's why we're going back to it. But I want to come back to it at a cheaper price and with I... less stress and with everything else ready for it because. I need a receiver, and I've got to make that decision. And talking to you, the Denon sounded good, yes. but uh, the Denons, correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe if other people are shopping for or have Denons, they, this will be interesting to them. The uh, Odyssey EQ program that lets you tweak the curve yep. after the, the Odyssey fact. Odyssey Editor app, yeah. That costs money. You have to pay $20 for it. That's correct, yeah. Okay, no. I don't, uh-uh. <laughs> no. No, <laughs> why much. No. Yes, it's too much. It should be zero dollars. Ninety nine cents would be too much because why isn't that included with a Denon app? Because it's Dude, optional. Well, I, I but, mean, direct to get the full version of direct, you have to spend ninety nine dollars on top of the thing and, that already comes. I never in, will, so. even if I could afford. I just won't because it's just a principle of the thing. My, my receiver, part of its features, needs to be an app that operates it. Now, ah. so that kind of pushes me back toward Yamaha, which I'm very used to. Sure. Uh, Yamaha's Wipeow. Once it sets itself, you can just bring up the manual settings, tweak yeah. the curve however you want, right there on the receiver without That's an true. app, save it, and boom, it's done. So it's just this like turning bass and treble up, uh, or up and down, however you want it. So I, I did like that. So I'm kind of leaning back toward Yamaha, and I'm also trying to calm down my whole, like, what if I want this feature? What if I want that feature? <laughs> Let's just buy what I need. Yeah. I know that's a thought process that goes through a lot of listeners' minds. Like, but what if I, but what if I, but what if I? And so, <laughs> you sure. know, we talked a lot about what if I want to send two different things to those two different TVs. They're on opposite yes. sides of the wall from each other. Yeah. And then I've had to just kind of calm down and think, how often am I really going to do that? Okay. Kind that of That does zero. make a difference. Because <laughs> in the den, honestly, I'm either going to watch the cable box or I'm going to watch, you know, YouTube or Netflix. And that can all happen independently. Yes. Oh, yeah. That Anything that you can do and buy a, a separate source, you right. can just plug straight into the TV. And yeah. on the few occasions I could think of where I might want the where I might want both of them watching the same thing at the same time, I don't need independent HDMI to both. It can just okay. be the same thing. And Which so, you could actually just do with a splitter. You don't even need mirrored HDMI outputs built into the receiver itself. You can exactly. Just do a splitter. Frankly, I could do it right now if my receiver I had right now was working. <laughs> I wouldn't even buy another receiver. So I'm just going to calm down. Uh, I like the amps. I like the the yep. the, the wattage they put out on the Denon. I, I saw that, and I, apparently, you know, Yamaha can't put quite as much into four ohms, but I have kind of six ohm speakers and eight ohm speakers. 
and uh, just from some reviews I saw. So Yamaha's amps aren't quite as strong as Denon's, it seems like, nah. for the same rating. But nah, no hooey hooey. <laughs> I, their pre-outs apparently don't have as high a voltage. That does tend to be the case. Yeah, the pre-outs tend to be but lower in voltage. Denon's guess if nice, I'm ever nice going to do external pre-outs. amps. Guess if That's I'm true. ever, ever going to do external amps. I know myself. It sounds cool. Well, this, this is the feature creep thing. Man. You, you yes. Get, you get roped into all the look oh look at the feel oh i i i could maybe do something with that yeah right 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 so i'm kind of wanting to back down and i'm going to look more at these yamahas i'm used to at a cheaper price because (laughs) honestly the one i had after i got over the fact that it didn't have the magic base extension button from my old 1999 receiver Mm -hmm. it didn't have the like just push this button and all the base gets bigger it's compensating for having no subwoofer and I don't, but my main speakers have these giant 15-inch woofers that, honest to God, can shake the neighbor's house. I don't know, they're just not positioned correctly, as That's we've true. mentioned before. That's true. It is yes. less than ideal, but again, it's just like, I uh, can't remember which listener earlier, but if I'm happy, <laughs> then isn't it perfect? <laughs> right? I mean, if I'm Play happy... Your sweeps. If your sweeps are even, then you're good. Yeah. So if I'm... And, and, or even if they're not perfect, if I don't care, yeah. then oh, it's yes. also okay. Yes. Right. And so it's also, a, you know, like how much money do I want to spend to fix a problem that's only bothering me a tiny bit? Right. Yeah. You know, and how much would I, what, what's really bothering me? And so as we, <laughs> as we backed up and decided, let's talk about what's really bothering us. These convenience features are bothering us mm. more. The receiver's right. bothering us more. All these other things are bothering us more than the quality of the actual picture in the living room. So we're just Well, that is a good point that actually, like the guys over at AV forums, the ones in the UK... Uh, they've been talking quite a bit recently on their podcast and in their reviews of televisions that, that they're focusing more and more on the usability of the TV because they're like, you know yes. what? All of these high-end TVs, they look fantastic. Like we can nitpick, Generally, yes. we yeah. can nitpick about the, the small and they all have some deficiencies of their own. This is true. And that used to be the only thing that you cared about. Mm-hmm. But they're like, you know, now what really matters is the usability of these things. Which ones are, are slow? You know, you press the button and there's a delay before it responds to right, you. Right. Uh, which ones have the apps that you want? How do the apps work on the thing? Are they slow to load? Are they hard to navigate? Like these are the things that are now the complaints as opposed to just out and out picture quality because mm-hmm. everybody across the board is putting out pretty darn amazing picture quality now. This is true. Uh, apparently, I'm just more bothered by viewing angle than most of the public. Yeah, there you go. And so that's important to me, and that makes the you know the IPS screen, if it's an LCD or the yeah. OLED, more important to me. Uh, but the other thing that's super frustrating, I live in a small city of 100,000 people. We just have a Best Buy. That's it. Right. You got right. Best Buy. And if you go into Best Buy, unlike the old days, you can't screw with the television. No, I was like, cannot. hey, can you get me the remote so I can mess with this? No. Oh, the, whatever and, you do only lasts about five seconds and then it pops right yeah. back. And I'm like, yep. can I, can I plug in my own thing? No. Yeah. Can I do anything? Then why am I here? I'm only here <laughs> so that I can return it if I hate it. Well, and now it's their own fault. If they don't want you to return stuff, it's their own darn fault because the only option they've left you is to take it home, take Thank it out you. of the box, set it up, try it and return it. Because they still, exactly. I mean, Best Buy to their credit does still have a pretty good return policy. They have a good return policy, but what a pain, especially on a big TV. I, so yeah. I don't know. I, ha- I have to rely on YouTube reviews and websites <laughs> to see how does this thing operate. And then I have to go, okay, mm-hmm. do I like what this person likes? You know, it used to be that you'd go to a store like a Best Buy or Circuit City back in the day, and the remote control would be sort of tied to the television yep. with a, with a like, you know, curly cord. And you could at least stand back and uh, play well, I guess you with could it. Still, you could bring your harmony with you, but, the, yeah. but they do they put they put it in that store <laughs> yeah. mode where it does deep, it, it reverts back very quickly. So. Right. So all I can do. All I can do in Best Buy is look at the viewing angle. Yeah. That's what I'm down to. And so <laughs> it's super frustrating. Yeah, it's you can't hard. really even evaluate the black levels because you've got that big fluorescent lights coming down on you. So Yeah, now maybe if I drive to another city to where they have the Magnolia yes. version of Best Buy, maybe they'll let me mess with stuff because their TVs are probably calibrated in those fancy rooms and such. But here, still Best Buy. <laughs> it's still Best Buy. But here I am stuck in my little cute small city uh, that, you know, that we've got the one thing and that's it. So that was another frustration. I think I just, I just got way more stressed out buying an awesome television <laughs> than I should have. Like everything about it got on my damn nerves. Well, it's also the price because this is not an insignificant amount. No, I mean, if, the, if this was, no. I really don't care. I have $2,500 that I can throw around anywhere. Well, then, right. then you don't mind so much. But when it's like, when it's like, no, I have to care about this money and budget for it. Yeah, yeah. We can afford it, but it is not a simple thing. Yeah, that's where we are. It's not an insignificant purchase. Yeah. It's like if I loved it, uh, we can we can live with that purchase and still get a couple right. of other things we need to get in life. But that you know, so 
I know there's a lot of us here on this cusp of being able to afford certain things and you're like, God, I love it so much. I'm willing to just forego some dinners out (laughs) and let's, you know, but, uh, yeah, when too many things pile up that irritate you, sure. Then that overcomes Uh, the picture. Nothing replaces firsthand experience. So. Right. So hopefully there's my lead, experience. Hopefully I, you're not you're feeling like I led you too far astray or that no, I lied to no, you. No, 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 <laughs> no. You did a great job. That's why I thanked you. And so people listening to this show, honestly, this the resource you have with Tom and Rob being able to ask these questions is invaluable. And and, and I know they don't mind asking, answering things ahead of time. If you're thinking right. about a purchase, that happens all the time. So I recommend people listening, ask them the questions you have, man. It's, it's very helpful. And yet, when we try our best, it still might not be what you wanted. So it's still, but that's okay. That's yeah, okay. Hopefully, hopefully, none of this was your way. fault, Rob. Absolutely, <laughs> no, man. You you did everything right. You told me everything you said was true. Uh, it's just that uh, some things you didn't take into account that bothered me, and we're all different, right? So you know, yes. just know that if you're if you're in my situation and you can't just burn twenty five hundred dollars, uh, and and you have no choice but to deal with something like Best Buy, then just be ready. Have it in your head that the thing's going back. And then just let it be a surprise when everything turns out great and you don't have to take it back. <laughs> there you go. Lower your expectations, then you can only be pleased. <laughs> That's my yeah, my theory on life going forward with all electronics. Lower those expectations, people. But I'm not going back to stereo, by God. I'm not doing it. Okay. Not when <laughs> well, did had... you want to hang out and do a couple more or do you need to run? I probably need to, well, yeah, I kind of need to get on. Okay. Because I well, got to go don't... cook dinner and uh, there's some other things I need to accomplish today. Very good. Well, why don't we let people know how they can get in touch with you? You can cut out. I think I think I'll carry on and do a couple more so that Tom isn't mad when he comes back. And goes, why are there so many questions left? Because we have lives and you don't, Tom. No, uh, <laughs> Tom's far does. away. He's Tom's way out in the ocean, ago. so he's it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> Tom's in a beautiful part of America having a good time. He can he'll be happy when he comes back, so he won't be as mad. Uh, yeah. So if people want to reach me, if you want to talk about my OLED experience, talk about receivers, especially Yamahas that I know something about, uh, or, you know, IPS screens that I know something about, uh, find me on Twitter. It's at Lee over tweet. Very good. Well, Lee, I'll say your last name over street so that people know what it is. Uh, Sorry. thank you so much for, uh, for coming in and, and, uh, pinch hitting co-hosting with me once again. I really do oh, appreciate it. No you problem, man. Here. This really is fun every time. I hope I can continue to do this a lot. And maybe in the future, as I've keep threatening to talk to you about my digitization of old tapes. That's right. Well, that's going to be a whole special. That's going to be an interview special. It, it so. will be. that. I think I think a lot of listeners will enjoy that. It's fun when you Hopefully. get to watch your old family videos over a network. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, Lee, go enjoy your dinner. Thank you so much for being here. But folks, don't go away just yet. I'm going to carry on for at least a couple more questions. All right. All on my lonesome. You guys have a good time. Thank before. you, Rob, again. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye, Lee. Bye. All righty. So let's carry on now with uh, Terry G's question. Terry has a 135-inch 1.0 gain projection screen, and he's currently using a Sony VPL HW55 ES 1080p projector. So using projection, uh, the projection calculator over at Projector Central, uh, which is a great resource over at Projector Central, they have a projection calculator for essentially every model of projector that's out there. Um, and you can look up all different kinds of specs, but especially the uh, throw distances that are necessary for a given screen size. That's what it's really most useful for. So he went ahead, he entered his model number, his screen size, and his 14 and a half foot projection distance from the lens to the screen. And it said that he should be getting about 15 foot Lamberts. And that seems to line up with what he's experiencing. He's getting uh, a nice image that looks bright, but isn't too bright. It's not making him squint or his uh, pupils close down or something like that. And that's right what... Uh, uh, which is supposed to have between 14 and 16 foot Lamberts is the target for standard dynamic range with a projector. So now Terry is considering upgrading to a JVC X790 projector and keeping the same distance from the screen to the lens. Uh, the projection calculator for that model, the X790, says he'd be getting about 32 foot Lamberts, so a little more than twice the light output. Uh, so Terry's just wondering, is that correct? Is the JVC really a little over twice as bright as his current Sony? And would the image actually look twice as bright all the time? Or is that only for the small HDR highlights since the X790 is an HDR capable projector? Uh, so Terry, what's going on there is uh, Projector Central, they don't go strictly by the spec, the lumen output spec, because you'll notice that the HW55 Sony specs 1700 lumens and the JVC X790 specs 1900 lumens. And clearly that wouldn't give you twice as bright an image if they were just going by the stated lumen output spec. Uh, But what they do tend to go by is they put the lamp into high mode, they put the projector into cinema mode, 
or into its brightest, uh, you know, sort of out of the box, somewhat accurate mode. It's not not necessarily going to be completely accurate, but like out of the sports mode or something that's going to be way too blue. And they go by that. Uh, so the JVC can get significantly brighter. It does have this HDR mode. It can output about twice the light. And that's exactly what you want. You want to be hitting uh, normally. So like 15 foot Lamberts equates to about 50 nits, since we talk about HDR in nits, uh, candela per square meter. Uh, so you convert that over to foot Lamberts and 15 uh, foot Lamberts equals about 50 nits and 30 foot Lamberts equals about 100 nits. Uh, and that's exactly what we want on projectors. 100 nits uh, is what we're aiming for with HDR and 50 nits is what we're aiming for with standard dynamic range. So it's great that it can do that. It means that for your screen size with that projection distance, you can get what we're looking for with HDR. Uh, but there's all sorts of options. It has an iris that you can close down. It has lower lamp modes. When you go into HDR mode, it, it kicks itself into high lamp mode automatically. So you can kick that down to the low or eco lamp mode, cuts the light output. So for standard dynamic range, you can absolutely set it to have the same 15 foot Lamberts you're, you're seeing right now. It's not going to look twice as bright for any of that. When you go to HDR mode, it can kick into high lamp mode, open up its iris and give you that full 100 nits that you're, that you're actually hoping to get. So it's all good. Uh, so yeah, his second question then is if he's got, uh, well, he has a very blacked out theater that has no uh, ambient light and minimal reflective surfaces. So I guess he went for some close to matte paint or something like that. Uh, so that he, since he's got that, he's excited about the deeper black levels that the JVC can produce. Uh, but would the distance from the projector's lens to the screen make a difference to the black levels? 14 and a half feet is almost as close as the JVC can be to create a 135 inch screen. I think it said it can get to uh, 13 feet and 10 inches or something like that is the absolute closest it could be. So he's only at 14 feet and six inches, not a whole lot farther back. Um, so if he um, were to move it back and he's only got about a foot of play to move it back, would that make any difference? Would that improve things, worsen things? Um, so you do have to remember that on a projector, uh, it doesn't have like local dimming, right? It's got this lamp that's outputting a constant amount of light and that lamp is being, that output of light is being modulated by, in this case, liquid crystal on silicon. That's what's modulating how much light reaches the screen. And then there's also an iris. Uh, so there's a dynamic iris that's opening and closing. So if the scene overall that you're watching is very bright, the iris will open up. If the scene overall is very dim, it'll close down. But if you have bright objects on the screen at the same time as dark objects, then the iris is going to be somewhere in the middle and you're just relying on the liquid crystal on silicon to modulate the light that's coming out of the lamp. And the lamp light is constant depending on what uh, lamp mode you set it in high lamp mode, low lamp mode. That amount is just constant. So when you bring the projector closer, um, you know, now you're using a wider angle. So there's a, a greater angle from the center of the lens to the edge of the screen. So you're shooting it out at a wider angle. The projector is closer. Um, the lamp is the same. The iris is still working the same. Uh, but there do tend to be some differences uh, in the zoom lens. So as you move the projector farther and farther away from the screen and you're more and more to the telephoto end of, of the screen, um, telephoto end of the lens, you it does tend to cut the light output. So that's cutting the light output of the lamp. That's cutting the light output that's reaching the liquid crystal on silicon panels in the first place. Uh, that's what that telephoto or wide angle uh, zoom lens is doing. So overall, the entire image, including the black levels, is getting dimmer the farther you pull the projector away from the screen. The more of the telephoto end of the zoom lens you're using, the dimmer the whole thing gets. Uh, but you kind of want those 30 foot Lamberts for HDR. If you went all the way, I mean, you don't even have the physical space to do it, but if you went all the way to the telephone end, you might not hit 30 foot Lamberts anymore. It might be dimmer than that. Uh, and the black levels of those liquid crystal and silicon panels that JVC is using are so good inherently. Uh, I mean, for a long time, they didn't bother using dynamic irises because it wasn't really necessary. They threw them in there now, but it, it still isn't really necessary. They have really, really good native contrast. It's not OLED native contrast, but it's it's better than essentially any LCD flat panel that doesn't have local dimming. Um, it, it's doing a better job of the inherent contrast than that. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I, a foot back, I don't know if you'd notice any difference at all. 
uh, but it would all be down to the zoom lens, slightly reducing the light output if you pulled it farther back. Uh, so let's hit up Andrew T, who wrote to us on Facebook. Uh, Andrew, he was getting a whining sound from one of his subwoofers. And long story short, he tracked the problem down to his in-wall subwoofer cable. So plugging his subwoofer directly into his receiver with a just a regular cable, you know, sub to receiver, like you would normally do, fix the issue. No more whining, sub was working fine, so... He tracked it down to being the cable that's inside his wall. He did run that cable inside of a conduit, as we've recommended, and he could replace the cable without having to open up his walls or anything like that. He had opted for a cable from Amazon. It was actually one of their Amazon branded, uh, not their basics line, which is their inexpensive one, but one tier up from that. And I'm not sure what the name is, but Amazon branded one tier up from basics. And he's wondering if he just got a higher quality subwoofer cable, would that fix his issue or was there something else maybe causing this um i mean it, it's a little bit tough to diagnose i'm glad that you discovered that your subwoofer itself is working fine and your receiver is working fine it's in these instances it's it's rarely the like actual cable it's usually one of the connectors um I imagine you're using some sort of wall plate so that you're connecting the cable that's inside of the wall to a wall plate and then the other side of that wall plate uh, would be connecting to a cable that goes from the wall plate to your sub and then another one on the other end from the wall plate to your receiver. I imagine that's the setup and it's it's usually in those connections. Uh, sometimes you're just crimping on to the wall plate or sometimes there's just an RCA jack inside of that wall plate and you're just plugging in an RCA cable. It's really, I mean, this is just a standard coaxial cable. Uh, it's highly unlikely that that is actually producing this. It's almost always the connector. He was thinking it's a ground loop, uh, but a whining wouldn't be a ground loop. A ground loop is a very obvious 60 hertz hum. Uh, it, it's 60 hertz, so it's a bass note. It's a steady constant hum if it's a ground loop and and he used the word whining which sounds like a higher frequency when i think of whining versus a, a low hum uh so that maybe it was interference of some sort um that could happen if it's like very close proximity to a dimmer switch sometimes. Um, yeah, it, it's tough to diagnose exactly what that is, but it might be interference. If it is interference, then yes, having a better quality shield on that cable would help you. Uh, you do want to make sure that it's a properly shielded coaxial cable. There's a lot of coaxial cables where they only physically attach the shield on one end of the cable instead of on both ends. And they do that to try and avoid a ground loop, uh, but then it essentially negates the effect of the shield <laughs> largely for quite a few frequencies. So I'm not in favor of that. Do it properly, get rid of your ground loops the, the correct way by, by not having them instead of negating your shield in order to try and avoid them. So uh, it's possible. It's possible that's what it was. Uh, the ones where the shield is only connected on one end of the cable are actually directional cables. So literally turning the cable around, which would be a hassle inside your wall, but at least you have a conduit. Um, you could pull it out, see if reversing which plug goes into the sub and which plug goes in the receiver. If that gets rid of it, uh, then you know that you have one of those cables where the shield is only physically attached on one side of it. Uh, speaking of ground loops, he asks in simple terms, what is a ground loop? What causes it? Well, a ground loop is just a difference in potential and otherwise potential we refer to as voltage when it comes to electricity. Uh, so what's supposed to happen in all of your electrical circuits is that every electrical box that you have is supposed to have usually just a bare little copper wire, no jacket around it, uh, attached to that um, wall socket or the junction box that might be, uh, you know, in your ceiling or something like that. That box is supposed to have a little bare piece of copper wire and that's all of the cop those little bare pieces of copper wire are supposed to run back to one grounding screw at your panel so that everything in your house goes back to the same ground. Then you have your two leads that actually go to your electrical outlets. You have your, your hot lead, your signal lead, and you have your neutral lead. And the neutral lead is also supposed to go to ground. That's what it is. So that's why you can have a two-prong device. It's not ungrounded. It's just that the neutral of that is the ground. When you have a three-prong device, that third prong, that round prong on North American outlets at the bottom, that is just attaching to the 
ground leads of that electrical box. It's just supposed to be grounding. So like you would have it on anything that has a metal case. You want that grounding things. It's grounding the case. That's what it's doing. It's not grounding the uh, transformer inside of the device that's actually powering a device. It's grounding the, uh, the metal case outside or it's grounding the electrical box that's inside of your wall. So what sometimes happens is either because of old construction where they didn't have that third wire that all goes back to one grounding screw or somebody got lazy and decided instead of running that one wire all the way back to the panel, I'm just going to attach it to, uh, oh, this copper pipe right here next to it while the wall is open. Uh, those two things don't necessarily go to the same ground. And if they don't go to the same ground, there's a possibility of having a slightly different, uh, different voltage that's, uh, that's coming through those two wires. And when you have a slightly different voltage, that causes a current to flow. And that current, when it flows, comes out as a 60 hertz hum in an audio device, or you might see static lines on a television. That would be another way you might see it. So that's what it is. Difference in potential from the things not all being connected physically to the same screw. They don't all go to the same place. They go to two different places, stuck into two different parts of the ground, and you get a slightly different voltage potential from that. Uh, last question from Andrew is, uh, his TV is a Samsung KU7000. It has built-in Plex and Netflix app, and the picture from the apps looks great. Uh, and uh, they are able to activate his television's HDR mode. So the video all seems to be working fine for everything that's built in. But he has a Denon receiver, and his Denon receiver, if he presses info, it lets him see the input and output settings, or he can look that up on the Denon's remote app on his phone and see the signals going in and the signals going out from his Denon. And whenever he uses his Xbox One S to play Netflix or Plex, the Denon reports that he's getting 4K video. But if he uses the television's built-in apps, the Denon says that the video is 720p when he's seeing on his television that it's activated HDR and it's 4K HDR or at the very least 1080p HDR. So why is his Denon saying it's 720p? Well, when you're using your Xbox One S, the output of the Xbox One S is plugged into one of the inputs of your Denon. So the video and audio are both being sent through your Denon receiver, and then out of your Denon comes the video, and that's sent on to your television. So if 4K HDR is coming out of your Xbox One S, uh, that's going into your Denon, and your Denon says, I'm getting 4K HDR in, and I'm sending 4K HDR out to your television. That's all good, and that all works fine. When you're using the apps that are built into your television, the only signal that's being sent back to your Denon is the audio via the HDMI audio return channel. And it isn't sending a video signal, and HDMI audio return channel uh, came along when we were still using HDMI 1.4 maximum. It came along before we were supporting 4K resolutions. So there are devices like the HD Fury uh, AVR key, and the whole point of that thing is to separate a 4K signal into 4K video that you can send to a 4K display and then audio that is compatible with an older receiver. And the way that it does that, it is actually, it, it tricks your older receiver by saying, oh, this is actually just 720p video with HDMI audio attached to it. That's the signal I'm sending to you, AV receiver, uh, whereas... I'm separating out the 4K video and sending that to your 4K display. That's what the HD Fury H, uh, AVR key does. Well, HDMI audio return channel does a very similar thing. It reports back to the audio device on the other end of the audio return channel that it's just sending an HDMI 1.4 signal. It's saying I'm sending HDMI audio with 720p video. That way it's compatible with anything, anything that could support it. It's, com it's a compatible signal. And your Denon is saying, oh yeah, I'm getting a 720p video signal. That's what's coming in. But, uh, but not to worry, the video is going directly to your television from inside the television's apps, and the only thing being sent to the Denon is audio. It just happens to come along with a compatible video signal flag that no AV receiver will reject, no matter how old it is, as long as it supports audio return channel. So last person I'm going to answer today is Alex P. Alex has a 1080p projector and a 5.2.2 Atmos speaker setup. He continues to get discs by mail from Netflix. So rented Blu-ray discs are his primary source for content. He noted that very few Blu-ray discs that he's received include the Atmos or DTS X immersive audio soundtrack, but he has seen that most Ultra HD Blu-ray versions have Atmos or DTS X on them. So he doesn't intend to upgrade his projector for a while, and therefore his only reason to upgrade to Ultra HD Blu-ray would be for the audio. 
he would have to buy an Ultra HD Blu-ray player. He'd have to convert the 4K HDR video from those discs to 1080p standard dynamic range for his projector, uh, which you, of course, can do with uh, with the player itself. I recommend the Sony X800 player to do that because it gives you some settings that allow you to adjust the overall level, uh, the brightness level of the picture as a whole when it's converting from HDR down to SDR. So I like that player. It doesn't cost too much. It's about $220 and it gives you those options to raise or lower the brightness of the image as a whole when you're converting HDR to SDR. Uh, but then he's also saying since Netflix isn't renting 4K Blu-rays by mail just yet, he'd have to pay more to get Ultra HD Blu-rays. A great place to do that is rent4k.com. They're a service that's similar to Netflix, but as their name suggests, all they do is rent Ultra HD Blu-rays, but you're right, the price to do so is a little bit higher than Netflix's uh, disc by mail subscription. Uh, and of course, buying the discs would be more expensive. So he's like, okay, he gets all that. Would it be worth it? <laughs> If he, if it's just for the audio, is this worth it? Or should he just stick with his regular Blu-rays from Netflix? A handful of them will have Atmos or DTSX, but for the most part, he'll be using the upmixer, the Dolby Surround upmixer, the DTS Neural X upmixer. What's our opinion on this? Um, so you're probably expecting me to, me to say like, yeah, gung-ho, absolutely get Atmos, get DTSX. But I'm looking at this and I go, you have a 5.2.2 set up. Um, so as is, even with a dedicated Atmos soundtrack or a dedicated DTSX soundtrack, uh, you're not getting the front to back panning overhead. You only have one pair of speakers above you. Um, so you're not getting the whole experience of Atmos or DTSX as is. And, uh, you certainly wouldn't be seeing 4K HDR if you're not going to upgrade your 1080p projector. And to be honest, uh, even with that Sony or even with the Oppo Ultra HD Blu-ray players, in my experience, converting HDR to SDR um, looks, looks pretty darn good, but it, it doesn't look perfect. There's a few things where it, it, it the regular Blu-ray version looks a little bit superior in some of the, the way the color saturation is set or some of the shadow detail or the highlight detail. Um, it's, it's not the easiest thing converting HDR to SDR. So in some respects, it's sometimes a little bit of a downgrade uh, when you're watching an Ultra HD Blu-ray on a standard dynamic range set, a 1080p standard dynamic range set. Um, so my opinion is I would, I would probably wait. I would probably wait. Um, as much as I am obviously a fan of Atmos and DTSX. Uh, once you upgrade to a setup that has four overhead speakers, I'd consider it a lot more highly. Uh, if and when you upgrade to a 4K HDR projector, of course, you're going to want to upgrade to Ultra HD Blu-rays then. But I think uh, the experience you're getting right now, up sampling or uh, well, up mixing with the Dolby Surround Up Mixer or DTS Neural X, uh, it's not going to be so drastically different from actual native Atmos or actual native DTSX given that you only have two overhead speakers. Eh, one man's opinion. I'm the only one here right now to answer your question. Sorry, Alex, we don't have Tom or Lee to weigh in on this, but I'm not sure they'd give they'd give tremendously different answers. Given your setup, uh, I think I'd stick where you are. That saves you the money, and you're still getting a good experience. So uh, that is all I'm going to answer today. We're going to have uh, three questions or people with uh, sometimes multiple questions left over. That would be Damien, Josh Z, and... Bob from the Philippines. Those are the folks who have written into us, and we will answer your questions on the show next week. And uh, this is AV Rant, where we answer your home theater and AV questions. And to get your question answered, all you have to do is ask by emailing us. You want to send that to question at avrant.com. For our other contact information, you can go back to the top of the podcast where we give it out there. So once again, I want to thank very much Lee Overstreet for stepping in as our guest co-host this week. Uh, we all hope that Tom Andrea and his family are having a great time in Puerto Rico on his vacation. Thanks so much for tuning in and listening. For AV Rant, I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com.
A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.